Welcome back. And today we are going to look to the class of the Cloud Foundation. And this is going to be the first lesson to prepare you for the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner. So I am Dr. Basil Magable, a certified AWS instructor and educator. And I would like to help you to get the AWS certificate, which is the first step to basically build your career in the AWS Cloud. The course prerequisite, we expect you to have a generic IT knowledge, a generic IT technical knowledge and business knowledge. And we prefer if you know a bit about the cloud computing concepts, working knowledge of a cloud computing and distribution system, and you are familiar with general networking concepts and the multi-tier architecture. But if you don't, don't worry, because in this class, I'm going to help you to be certified and to build in the cloud because I help thousands of students to be certified and many of my students they are working currently in AWS and many other organizations. The course is divided into 10 lessons. We will look to the cloud concept, then we will look to the billing and then to the global infrastructure and then we will look to the AWS cloud security and the responsibility and the shared responsibility model of AWS cloud computing. Then we will look to the networking and content delivery Normally, this is the VPC. And I can tell you guys from my personal experience, if you understand a VPC, you will be able to pass the cloud practitioner very easily. Then we will study compute services, how we can build an EC2 machine, how we can build a Lambda function or Elastic Beanstalk, or build any compute service available to us like Elastic Com Container Service in the cloud. Then we will look to the storage service for s 3 and databases like MySQL in RDS. And then we will look to the well architected the framework by AWS and the automatic scaling and monitoring. So this course will help you to prepare for the cloud practitioner. Now, after you get the AWS cloud practitioner exam, you will be able to do the developer exam and the operation and the architect exam. And the solution architect, is one of the most distinguished certificates that you can get in the industry. It has the highest value now in the industry. So I recommend for you to target and to aim to get the Solution Architect Certificate. Now these are information about the exam and the AWS certificate. So feel free to go to these links and check. And there is also a sample exam, a question and the preparation guide. As well, I will make another lesson for you later on to prepare for the exam and how we can do the exam strategy. Now let us look to the first lesson, which is the cloud concept overview of cloud foundation. In this lesson, we will know what is a cloud computing and basically on-demand delivery of these IT resources, including compute power database storage and IT resources in a pay-as-you-go pricing model. And the concept here is very easy to understand because this is very similar to the utility model that we all use. If we want a gas heating for our houses, we go and make a subscription for a gas provider. If we want an internet connection to your home, you go and you make a subscription, which is a pay-as-you-go model to internet service provider. In the same way, we think now in the cloud computing to deliver those IT resources and you can lease them from a cloud provider like AWS so you can build in the cloud and you can use them to launch your product and services. So cloud computing guys help us to think about our infrastructure as a component of software that we can building them together as a building a block instead of thinking about our infrastructure as a hardware. Why hardware is not the optimal solution here? In the traditional computing model, when we deal with infrastructure as a hardware, we need to have a space, a staff, physical security, planning, capital expenditure, and we have all the time a long hardware recruitment cycle. If we want to order a server today, you need to wait for a few weeks or months for the server to arrive to your data center, and this is, will require you to have uh, to provision and to estimate your capacity. And you will guess that capacity. And most of the time, our guess is not correct. So maybe we order one server, but we find our product is very successful. So we need to order another one. Or maybe we order two servers, but actually our demand 
shows us that we only need one server to run the product. Because for a simple reason, there is no high demand coming to these servers. There are three main cloud service models. And these service model, we start with the one which has the less control over IT resources or what we call software as a service. In this kind of services, we are provided with the software out of the box with the complete product and we use it without configuring it, without making any adjustment to it or without any installation or setting. The next one is the platform as a service. In the platform as a service, this will reduce the need for us to manage the underlying infrastructure, but we think mainly about configuring the library and the deployment and the management of our application. So we don't have ability to configure the operating system or configure the CPU and the RAM in these kind of services. We only can configure the deployment model. And similar to what we will see later on in Amazon Relational Database Service, and AWS Elastic Beanstalk. The third model, which is infrastructure as a service. In infrastructure as a service, we have more control over the IT resources, and this gives us more control over the cloud infrastructure, so we can build our own virtual machine, build those cloud services from those building a block, and we have access to networking and to compute and to storage. And normally IS provide us with the highest level of flexibility and management to control over our IT resources. And it is the most similar existing IT resources that many IT departments use it today. A good example of infrastructure as a service is Amazon EC2. You will be able to build in the cloud infrastructure and to configure the operating system that you need the number of CPU, so you can assign a CPU to, a RAM I want to, and operating system I want Linux, and so on. Now, when a customer comes to you and he said, I heard from my friend that there is something called the cloud computing, and this is saving him a lot of money because he migrate his business to the cloud. Now, there is a three main deployment model of cloud computing. The first one is called all in the cloud which means we move everything completely and everything will be fully deployed in the cloud without having anything left on premise data center. The second one is to have a private cloud and this is a private cloud where we can deploy resources on a premises using those virtualization and resource management tools and sometimes those private clouds, they will be using AWS services in those private on a premise data center. Like USGov, for example, there is an AWS USGov, which is a private cloud, which means you need to be authorized and authenticated to access the USGov. And there is the hybrid cloud, which is a mix between all in the cloud and on a premise data center. Part of your resources in the cloud and other part of your resources on a premise. Normally, when you have your data, for example, you want to keep your data on a premise and you have your a cloud infrastructure speaking with those back-end data or data model in your on-premise data center from that cloud. Now, cloud computing gives us its six main advantages. And the first one, as you know now, we trade capital expense for variable expense. Because of the cloud computing, guys, we don't need to worry about the cost associated with building a data center from scratch, but now we can, in a pay-as-you-go model, we can lease those resources from AWS, and we will start building our uh, product and services, and we have to pay a monthly bill. And there is a massive economy of scale, which means we have a large access. When we use cloud computing, we can have a lower variable cost than you can get when you have your own data center. Because usage from hundreds of thousands of customers is aggregated in the cloud, enable AWS to achieve a high your economy of scale, which it translates into lower pay as you go price model for the end customer. The third one is to stop guessing capacity. So we don't have now, once we use AWS Cloud, we are going to have an auto scaler 
and that auto scaler will look to our infrastructure and it will adjust the capacity based on the demand it will add or remove resources based on the actual demand so we won't have an overestimated server capacity we order one server but we find we need three or we order three servers and we find that we need only two and we can increase the speed and agility and we can sp stop spending money on running and maintaining data center and we can go global in minutes so aws cloud computing can enable us to increase the time to market when we build and focus on building a product we can release it very quickly and fastly to the cloud or to the customer and we stop spending money on the long running cost of data center and we can go global in minutes and you will see later on anything we do in, in the aws management console even the labs we do together they are going to be available for you to share with your friends in another country so any product you build in aws you will be able to uh, make it globally available in a few minutes so what is aws aws is a secure cloud platform that offers a broad set of global cloud-based products it gives us an on-demand access to the compute storage network database and other it resources that you might need for your project and the tools to manage them so you can immediately provision and launch aws resources and those resources are ready for you to use in minutes and this basically give you the ability to build your product from those wide range and broad set of AWS services as a building a block. After you will finish my Cloud Foundation class, you will be able to build similar architecture. You will be able to build inside AWS the Cloud. You will be designing your own VPC. And inside this VPC, you will create your own subnet. And then you will launch a web server and you will launch and build an RDS for MySQL and then you will enable the web server to speak with the RDS and you will run your web server behind the load balancer and auto scaler which make your software highly available highly scalable and highly secure as well by adding an extra layer of security using what we call security group and this is what we, I will teach you in lesson four of this Eclipse. mainly in the cloud foundation we focus in four category of the foundation or the core services of aws we focus on the network services which are the vpc we focus also in the compute services which are the amazon ec2 which are the virtual machine and we focus on the database services like building an rds or DynamoDB, like mysql server and then we will focus on the storage like Amazon Symbol Storage Service, which is basically a service that we use to store files and the objects in the cloud or archives. So in the foundation, you need to worry only about these core services. And later on in the solution architect, we will learn more about those services in the future. So as I said, in the cloud foundation, we will look to compute services, storage services, management, database, cost management services like cost and usage report, AWS budget, AWS cost explorer, and then we'll look to networking and content delivery like Amazon VPC, Amazon Road 53, and Amazon Cloud Front and Elastic Load Balancing. With security and identity, we look to AWS IAM, Amazon Cognito, AWS Shell, AWS Artifacts, and AWS KM. So what we can take from this lesson? We managed to define different types of cloud computing models all in the cloud, hybrid cloud, and the private cloud. We also recognize the main AWS services or the core services, which are the networking, storage, database, and compute. And we describe six advantages of cloud computing. And then we look to the core AWS services that we are going to study in this class. Thank you for seeing this video and see you in the lesson two, which is the cloud economics and Bill. Welcome back to lesson two of Cloud Foundation. We are going to look today into cloud economics and billings and the AWS billing and dashboard. 
Before that, let us understand the fundamentals of pricing in AWS. So for compute services, you will be charged per hour if you use a Windows machine or if you create a virtual machine in the cloud, you will be charged per second for Linux machine. And this is varies between in a census type. So for a T2 micro, you are going to pay way less than a T2 X large. For storage, you will be charged by the number of gigabytes you store in S3 in Amazon Simple Storage Service. And for data transfer, we have a generic rule for that. All data in is free. When you move your data in the same region, it's also free. But when you move the data between two regions or two different regions like US East 1 and the Irish region, you are going to pay. How do you pay for AWS? You pay for what you use. So if you create one EC2 instance, you are going to be charged per hour if it is a Windows operating system or per second if it is a Linux operating system for 30 days, let's say, you're going to pay for that. However, if you reserve that EC2 instance and you reserve it in a contract of one or three year contract, you can get up to 75% of the on-demand price. And you can decide whether you want to pay all upper front or partial upper front or no upper front at all uh, for that EC2 instance. However, with AWS, you can get a volume-based discount as well to basically reduce the total cost. If you have a large volume of a project, then you can get a customer pricing from AWS. The third factor is you pay less when you use more and AWS grows. So when they create more region, this means they are going to reduce their pricing model. You can join AWS and you can create a free tier account for 12 months. And this is will enable you to gain a free hands-on experience with AWS a platform, a product and service. And then you can basically practice those labs for the cloud foundation or the solution architect there as well. Many of the services are eligible for the free tier and other services are not eligible for a free tier and join the AWS free tier account, just go to aws.amazon.com, create a free account. And now here we want to fill an email address. I'm going to put our channel email. You could go back now and you need to verify your email. You need to go back and you will be able to sign into the account. You will be having like all the services, will have access to all services in the management console. And be careful here because you need to make sure that you don't create any service that you don't need, or at least when you create a service for experiment, make sure to delete that service. Now, as you can see here, it's allocate me to the Irish region. I could switch to any of those regions as well. Later on from our account, we can specify to which regions you want your account to uh, use. Now let us just show you what is the free tier services here. If we go to EC2, from EC2, we want to launch an EC2 instance, and we will select the first AMI, which is the Amazon Linux 2 AMI. We're going to describe this in more details in the future, just to show you here. Now, there is a family, which is a T2 machine with one virtual CPU and one gigabyte of memory, and this is eligible for the free tier which means for the first 12 months from the account creation, you can use this machine for free. You can use this machine for free up to 750 hours of the micro instances each month. So basically you could start a new business using those machines. So these are the free tier service list that you can find here. So for example, we can get up to 750 hours for Amazon EC2. Amazon S3, you can get up to five gigabyte of data. Amazon RDS 750, with DynamoDB 250 gigabyte, SageMaker two months, and Lambda 1 million transaction per month. This is really good uh, value, guys. Like you can create a lot using the free tier account. Still, you will be charged for any data uh, that you move out of the region, any request or any other non-free tier services.
some services they come with no charge in AWS like Amazon virtual private cloud when you create a virtual private cloud it's going to be free of charge elastic beanstalk is a free of charge auto scaling AWS cloud formation when you use those services, you are not going to pay any price for them and the AWS identity and access management now the resources created by Elastic Beanstalk or auto scaling or cloud formation, let's say auto scaling you create and add two more machine to support the demand in your infrastructure, then this is will be charged. So the key takeaways that we have, there is no charge for inbound data, data transfer between services within the same region and pay for what you use. You can start and stop at any time with AWS services like on-demand instances. You don't need to have a long-term contract and some services are free of charge and other AWS services are free to use for a free tier account. And let us move on to the total cost of ownership. So the TCO is a financial estimate to help you identify the direct and indirect cost of a system. So if a customer come to you and he want to migrate his business to the cloud, you can use the TCO calculator to give him a comparison, a side-by-side -side comparison between the cost of running the system on a data center and the cost of running the system in AWS cloud. And a tool to help you to do that is the TCO. I highly recommend to have a look to the TCO to understand how to use it when you design and build your architecture before you go to AWS Management Console and you build it for real. So the TCO compare the cost of running an entire infrastructure or a specific workload on a premises versus an AWS a cloud and you can use it to budget and build the business case for moving any business to the cloud. Some of the costs that are associated with data center management will be included in the TCO calculation, like server costs, storage costs, network costs, and any IT labor costs as well will be estimated. You can use the AWS pricing calculator to help you to estimate a monthly AWS bill for your infrastructure. And you can use this tool to explore the services and create an estimate. Sometimes you use this tool to find out in which region I should create an EC2 machine. In which region I could basically create an S3 bucket and give me the lowest price among all other AWS region. You can model your solution before building them and you can explore the price points and calculations behind your estimate to find available instance type, contract term that meet your needs. The AWS pricing calculator estimates are broken into the total for your first 12 months, your total upfront, front, your total monthly bill as well will be considered. And to understand the TCO, especially if you are doing the cloud foundation for your master degree or MBA business administration, or you are coming to cloud computing from a business background or marketing background, I recommend that you use the AWS pricing calculator. So we have a scenario, we need to build an application using Amazon Simple Queuing Service, and this application will be in the Irish region. What we need to use, we need to use a VPC, Amazon Virtual and Private Cloud, a Simple Queuing Service, and Amazon Athena and Amazon Lambda, based on the data you are seeing here in the slide. Let's move on. The AWS organization is a free account management service that enable us to consolidate multiple AWS accounts into an organization that you create and centrally manage. The AWS organizations include consolidated billing and account management that help you to meet the budget and compliance of your business. The main benefits of organization guys is centrally managed access policies across multiple AWS account and they can have a controlled access to AWS service and automated AWS account creation and management and consolidated billing across multiple AWS account. However, just a quick note about AWS organization. It is the service that we use when we want to build the multi-account pattern in AWS. 
This is something we will understand later on in the solution architect. So when you have multiple teams, let's say you have a testing team in the United States, you have a dev team in Europe, and you have another team of a QA in India, for example, I want to create each team to manage their own budget and their security permissions by themselves, then the AWS organization is the right service for you. We call this the AWS multi-account pattern. Another service that you will find very useful to control your cost in AWS, it's the AWS billing and cost management. So you can set that service to monitor your monthly bill and the usage and the budget. You can also specify a budget for your monthly expenses. And you can use the billing and cost management to forecast and obtain a better idea about any future costs that will happen in your account. And you can set a custom time period or you can specify whether you would like to view your data at a monthly or daily level as well. There is other tools you can find very useful like the AWS cost and usage report tool, which enable you to identify any opportunity for cost optimization. And there is the AWS cost explorer, which can help you to explore the cost, or you can even use the AWS budget to set up an alert when your account reach a specific threshold. The next thing I want to demo is the billing. So if you go to your account, and from account, you can go to the billing and dashboard, which is the subject of the class today. You can see now I have not been working on this account in the last month, so I have zero money. However, you could go to the cost and usage report. You can create a new report, and that report will be like demo report. You can include the resource ID, you click on next. If you don't like spaces, go next. And now you can specify whether you want an hourly report or a monthly report. You can create a new report. And even if you have some data going out from Athena or Redshift or a quick site, you could also use that. And then you need to specify uh, the bucket that you need. So let's just call this demo and you can specify an existing bucket. I don't have a bucket. You can create a bucket demo cost and then you can use the region where you want the bucket to be created in my case i will create it in ireland click next and i have confirmed that this bucket is policy is going to be okay for me and then you click next and then review and complete so this is basically your cost usage report and you can open it and you can have a look to the demo cost that you have in a specific month in from from your s3 bucket you could also use the cost explorer you can launch the cost explorer service and the cost explorer can give you um, a good insight about the services that you use your saving plans and even if you have any saving uh, reservation for an ec2 instance and any recommendation the next thing I would like to demo is the AWS budget. You could create a budget. So when you create a budget, you could specify whether you want to put a cap on the cost to monitor the cost, or you monitor the usage, or you monitor also the saving. And let's use the cost budget now. Click next. This is going to be monthly caring budget. And this is like December 2021 fixed. I want to keep my account below $100 a month. You could also add specific parameters, so you can specify which budget value you need. Like for example, I have C5N4X large, and that's the instance I want to monitor. You could also uh, see blended cost between all the services, and you click on next, and you specify how much the budget will take effect every month and then click on the budget name this is demo and next and then create that budget so this is will 
send you email once your cost in a specific month start to reach the 100 threshold will give you an email or will send you an email to alert you about that there is four support plans that you need to understand for the exam there is the basic support which is any user will have once you join the aws management console there is the developer support plan there is the business which can basically comes with its own technical support team and there is the enterprise support which is basically run a mission critical workload that's pretty much what we need to do for the uh, module three let us move now to lesson three the aws global infrastructure welcome back to lesson three aws global infrastructure so let us get into it to understand the global infrastructure of aws let us look to the aws global infrastructure map so as you can see if you select that map you can select and choose a circle on the map to view a summary information about the region represented by the circle and also you can view the regions and the availability zones and you can also choose the tab to view a map of a selected geography and a list of regions edge locations local zones and regional caches the global infrastructure is designed and built to deliver a flexible and reliable, scalable, and secure cloud computing environment with high quality global network performance. The AWS Global Infrastructure is built around regions. AWS has 22 regions worldwide. An AWS region is a physical geographical location with one or more availability zones. Availability zones consist of one or more data centers to achieve fault tolerance and stability. A region is isolated from one another. The resources in one region are not automatically replicated to other regions. When you store data in a specific region, it is not replicated outside that region. It is your responsibility to replicate data across regions if your business needs require it. Selecting the right region for your services, applications, and data based on these factors. One essential consideration is data governance and legal requirements. In certain countries and due to local laws, some information cannot leave the border of the country. So let's say you have an Irish customer dealing with life science data stored in a database. In this case, the database should stay in the same country according to the EU Data Protection Act. It is recommended to run your applications and store your data in a region that is as close as possible to the users and systems that will access them. This will help you to reduce latency in your system and you could use a tool like Cloud Ping to check and to test the latency between your location and all AWS regions. Keep in mind that not all services are available in all regions, so you need to check first before migrating your infrastructure to that region. Finally, there is some variation in the cost of running services between regions. Each AWS region has multiple isolated locations that are known as availability zones. Each availability zone provides the ability to operate applications and database that are more highly available, fault-tolerant, and scalable than would be possible with a single data center. Each availability zone can include multiple data centers. Each data center can include hundreds of thousands of servers. They are fully isolated partitions of the AWS global infrastructure. All availability zones are interconnected with high bandwidth, low latency networking over fully redundant private network. You are responsible for selecting the availability zone where your systems will operate Systems can span multiple availability zones. AWS recommends replicating the data across multiple availability zones for data resilience. You should design your system to survive the temporary or any failure of an availability zone or a disaster if it happens. The foundation for the AWS infrastructure is the data centers. Customers do not specify a data center for the deployment of their application. Instead, an availability zone is the most granular level of a specification that a customer can make. However, a data center is the location where the actual data resides. Amazon operates state-of-the-art highly available data centers 
failure can happen that affect the availability of the instances in the same location if you host all your instances in a single location that is affected by such a failure none of your instances will be available data centers have a redundant design that anticipates and tolerates failure while maintaining service levels Amazon CloudFront is a content delivery network used to distribute content to end users to reduce latency. Amazon Route 53 is a domain name system service requesting going to either one of these services will be routed to the nearest edge location automatically in order to lower the latency. The AWS point of presence are located in most of the major cities around the world. By continuously measuring internet connectivity, performance and computing to find the best way to route the request. The point of a presence deliver a better near real-time user experience. They are used by many AWS services, including Amazon CloudFront, Route 53, AWS Shield, and AWS Web Application Firewall. Regional edge caches are used by default with Amazon CloudFront. Regional edge caches are used when you have content that is not accessed frequently enough to remain in an edge location. Regional edge cache absorb this content and provide an alternative to that content having to be fetched from the origin server. The purpose of this activity is to explore the AWS Management Console. You will gain experience by visiting multiple AWS services and you will also practice navigating to these services in different service categories. So if we go to the console now, you can find there is a list of all services based on their category. You could also use the search bar for searching for a specific service, for example, EC2, and you will visit the EC2 from the search result. You could also go to the service based on the category for a compute services, for database services. You can select DynamoDB, Amazon DB, or an RTS. You could also, by selecting the RDS, you will go to that specific service page and you can also start to work in the console. There is services for a blockchain, there is services for Internet of Things, and there is other services for containerization. So if we go to the network and content delivery, we can view there is a VPC or our virtual private cloud. Now by default, each region will have a default VPC created with all the required subnets. So this is like the default VPC in North Virginia, and these are the six available subnets because North Virginia contains six availability zones. You could also go and switch the region. If you switch the region to another region, you will find that each subnet is associated with a specific availability zone, and a VPC is always associated with a region. So going to the Irish region, you will find now different virtual private cloud ID and different number of subnets associated and specific only to the Irish region. If we go to a service like IAM, you will find that the IAM service is a global service, which means it's available in all regions. The configuration you made in the IAM service will be applied to all AWS regions. However, if you go to another service like Rose 53, it is another global service, which means it's not associated with a specific region. And the same thing apply when you use Amazon S3. But if you go to the EC2 services again, now you will see that the console changed the region name from global, and it will give you the name of the region where you are located. Now you will find that this EC2 will be only associated in North Virginia. If you change the region, you will get different number or different value of those EC2 because EC2 is not a global region. So what we learn in this lesson, AWS infrastructure is divided into region and availability zone. Selecting a region, your choice of a region is typically based on a compliance and requirements or to reduce latency. Each availability zone is physically separate from other availability zones and has a redundant power, networking, and connectivity. The AWS Global Infrastructure has several valuable features. First, it is elastic and scalable. Second, 
This infrastructure is fault tolerant. Finally, it requires minimal to no human intervention while providing highly available and scalable services. Thank you again and see you in the next one. Welcome back to another class of Cloud Foundation. Today we are going to discuss the AWS Cloud Security. So let us get into it. Security in the cloud is a shared responsibility between the AWS and the customer. AWS is responsible for the security of the cloud and the customer is responsible for the security in the cloud. AWS operates, manages, and controls the components from the software virtualization layer down to the physical security of its facility where AWS services operate. AWS is responsible for protecting the infrastructure that runs all the services that are offered in the cloud and this infrastructure is composed of the hardware, the software, the networking and the facilities that run the AWS cloud service. The customer is responsible for the encryption of the data at rest and the data in transit. The customer should also ensure that the network is configured for the security and that security credentials and logins are managed safely. The customer is responsible for the configuration of the security groups and the configuration of the operating system that run on compute instances that they launch. So the customer is responsible for the security in the cloud. To understand the responsibility of AWS, let us take a look into more details about that. AWS is responsible for the physical infrastructure that hosts the resources, including the physical security of data centers, the hardware infrastructure, the software infrastructure, and the network infrastructure. While the cloud infrastructure is secured and maintained by AWS, customers are responsible for the security of everything they put in the cloud. The customer is responsible for what is implemented by using AWS services and for the applications that are connected to AWS, including their application, security group configuration, OS or hosted based firewalls, network configuration, and accounts management. Infrastructure as a service refers to services that provide basic building blocks for cloud IT, including access to configuring networking, computers, virtual or on dedicated hardware and data storage spaces. Cloud services that can be characterized as an IS provide the customer with the highest level of flexibility and management control over IT resources. So AWS services such Amazon EC2 is an IS. In this case, the security of IS is the responsibility of the customer. Now, other services model like a platform as a service refers to services that remove the need for customer to manage the underlying infrastructure, hardware, operating system, and any other configuration. Those past services enable the customer to focus on deploying and managing applications, and customer don't need to worry about resource recruitment, capacity planning, software maintenance, or Patching. In this case, AWS services like AWS Lambda or Amazon RDS, which are a pass, they are the responsibility of AWS, not the responsibility of the customer. Software as a service like SaaS software, which refers to services that provide centrally hosted software that is typically accessible via a web browser or a mobile app or application API. The license model for SaaS is typically subscription or pay as you go. With SaaS offering, customers do not need to manage the infrastructure that supports the service and some of these AWS services like AWS Trusted Advisor or AWS Shield or Amazon Chem, those can be categorized as SaaS offering. Securing those services is the responsibility of AWS. So let us look into the first core service that we will learn in this class. The AWS Identity and Access Management is the service we use to create users groups and we control who can access which resources and how they can access it via the management console, the web portal, or via the command line interface of AWS. AWS IAM allows you to control access to compute, storage, database, and application services in the cloud. IAM can be used to handle authentication and to specify and enforce authorization policies so that 
you can specify which users can access which services. IAM is a feature of your AWS account and it is offered at no additional cost. To understand how to use IAM to secure your AWS account, it is important to understand the role and the function of each of the four IAM components. We have an IAM user, which is a person or an application that is defined in the AWS account and that must make an API call to AWS product. Each user must have a unique name within the AWS account and a set of security credentials that is not shared with other users. Users. These credentials are different from the AWS account root user security credentials and this is root account that you create when you sign up with AWS. When you define an IAM user, you select what type of access the user is permitted to use and you can assign two different types of access to users programmatic access and AWS management console access, and you can assign programmatic access only or the management access only. If you grant a programmatic access, the IAM user will be required to present an access key, ID, and a secret access key when they make an AWS API. If you want your user to access the management console, then the IAM user will be required to fill in the fields that appear in the browser login page, the user ID, which is a 12 digit, account ID and their password. If multi-factor authentication is enabled for the user, they will also prompt it to uh, provide that authentication code. AWS services and resources can be accessed by using the management console or the CLI or the SDK. To add an extra layer of security, it is recommended to enable the multi-factor authentication. When you enable multi-factor authentication, the user needs to provide a multi-factor authentication token, and this can be obtained from using a software like Google Authenticator or a U2F a security key or a hardware multi-factor authentication as we can see here in the picture. To assign a permission to a user, a group or a role, you must create an IAM policy. There are no default permission and all action in the accounts are denied to the user by default and we call this implicit deny. Any actions that you do not explicitly allow are denied. Any actions that you explicitly deny are always denied. So you need to follow the principle of least privilege, which is an important concept to apply once you go to the IAM service and you configure users and the group. Because the IAM service is a global service, so the settings that you apply in one region will be also implemented and applied to other regions. There is two types of policy. There is the identity-based policy and the resource-based policy. Identity-based policy is the type of policy we assign to users or a group of users. The resource-based policy is the policy we assign to a resource so another service can have access to it. So let us take example about a resource-based policy, but first let us define what we mean by a role. An IAM role is an IAM identity with specific permissions, similar to IAM user. You can attach a permission policy to it. It is different from IAM user because it is not uniquely associated with one person and it can assumed by a person or application or a service. A role provides us with a temporary security credentials. So for example, in this example here, we have a developer who runs an application on an EC2 instance that requires access to the S3 bucket. That S3 bucket is named photo. In order to give that permission to that EC2 user, the admin need to create an IAM role and attach the role to the EC2 instance. And the role includes a permission policy that grants read only or full S3 access to the S3. When the application runs on that EC2 instance, it can use the role temporary to access the bucket. The administrator does not need to grant the application developer permission to access the photos bucket and the developer never needs to share or manage those credentials. So let me show you how we can do this in the AWS Management Console. Now let us show you how you can create an EC2 profile and you will assign a role for an EC2. So let us create a demo EC2 and this EC2 I will will use it mainly to access an S3 bucket, to list the bucket, to list the object inside the bucket, and also to copy a demo file to that S3 bucket. I will keep everything to the settings to the default. I will add a tag. I will call this demo. 
of EC2 to SC3, and then I will configure a security group. I need only to enable uh, the SSH port because I will access this EC2 from my computer. Now the EC2 is ready, so let us go now and create a bucket. Let us go to SC3 and we will create another demo bucket just to show you guys how the EC2 could have read and write access to an SC3 bucket. Let's create a demo bucket again. This is, will be a demo and to give it a unique name in this region. So I'm going to call this cat photos, for example, to EC2. And I will put the date of today and happy new year to you all. I will keep the ACL to be enabled for the bucket owner and I will enable versioning as well because I'm going to use and show you in the future video how versioning could be used to protect accidental damage. Now we have the bucket created so let us go back now to our EC2 and we will download the PIM file and that PIM file we will use it mainly to access the EC2 via SSH and from the EC2 I want to copy a file to the SC3. Let me download the PIM file. If you are using a root account to do this demo just to create a new PIM file for your EC2 and download it and give it a permission chmod 400 or use potty the link for my potty video uh, for the windows user is going to be up in the card section of this video now let us go to the ec2 and get the public ip address again for potty user it's the same you will use the same ip address in potty click on yes now we have access to the ec2 what we want to do now is to check that we have access to the bucket uh, let's create file before touch demo.txt this is will create a file and i will open the file in nano and this is like a file a demo file i will put some some text in it let us write this is a file to show the ec2 to sc3 and we will save now let us do now an aws sc3 copy cp demo.txt to sc3 and we will specify the bucket name you could go back to sc3 and copy the bucket name at this stage if you don't have it so let me open sc3 in a new tab and this is my demo bucket i will copy the name and be careful here guys it's the name of the bucket not the arn and you can see there is a permission error we don't have the correct permission to be able to write to this bucket even if we do aws sc3 ls this means we don't even have a permission to sc3 as a service not only that bucket in specific so let us go now to im in im there is a role created it's called my sc3 role creation of the role is above the, the level of the cloud practitioner so we will show you this later on in the solution architect you can see here we are giving an ec2 in instance a full permission over an sc3 from the json all we need to do now is to go to the ec2 and from the ec2 we will basically modify the im role and we will assign the my sc3 role to it it's the last one there in the menu and click on save now let us try to copy the demo file again to sc3 and you will be able to see that this file is obviously copied successfully it has been uploaded to sc3 you can go back to sc3 and check so the file is there and we can view it as well in the console let us upload now a cat photo from my computer and the point here i just want to make sure not only i can write to this sc3 i could also list any new object remember sc3 give you give you hard consistency for a new object and read after write consistency for updated object later on in the solution architect if you are following this channel we're going to describe all of these in details i'm going to provide you with more details about it. now i am group is a collection of i am users i am groups over a convenient way to specify permissions for a collection of users which can make it easier to manage those permissions for those users so the key takeaways from this lesson today i am policy are constructed with a javascript notation and they can be used to define a permission i am policies can be attached to any other I am entity. Entities are I am user, I am groups, and I am roles. An I am user provides a way for a person or application or a service to authenticate to AWS. A group is a simple way to attach the same policies to multiple users, and the role can have permissions policies attached to it and can be used to delegate temporary access to users or application so let us take now a look into securing a new aws account and normally in the certificate exam they will ask you about this so in aws we have two types of user we have the aws account root user access which is the user you create once you sign up with aws 
and you provide your credit card, billing details, and so on. Also, you have the IM user, which normally you create using the IM service, and the best practice to not use the account root user at all unless it is necessary. There is some action that you can only do from the root user, updating the account root user password, changing the AWS support plan, because this is basically will be associated with an extra payment, also restoring an IM user permission, or changing the account setting, like the contact information, the allowed regions, the credit card you pay, the payment details. So now to understand IAM, let us do the first lab. In this lab, we are going to explore the users and the group, and then we will add user to groups, and then we will test different users once we sign in and sign out from the management console. So as you can see here in the diagram, we have three users we need to create and the three groups, and we want to assign each user to a specific group, and in each group, we will have a permission for that user. This is lab one, introduction to AWS IAM. We will study the IAM service, which is a service enable us to create users and the group, and we assign permission and security credentials to those users. And also we control how they can access the console, whether they can access it from the management console, the web console, or from the command line interface or the AWS CLI. Now in this lab, we are going to create the following architecture. We have a three user, user one, two, and the three, and we will assign those users to a specific group. So user one will be assigned the S3 support. And based on the permission that we have in that S3 support group, user one will be inherited an S3 read only access. User two is going to be assigned to the EC2 support and he will be assigned an EC2 read-only access. Now user 3 is going to be assigned the EC2 view start and the stop access for the EC2. So this means user 3 will be able to start a new EC2 instance and stop running EC2 instance. Now this is going to be your first lab if you are doing the Cloud Foundation class in the AWS Academy. So feel free to take your time doing this lab and try to practice doing this lab many times until you really find yourself comfortable dealing with the AWS Management Console. So let us now go and look to the first task. We need to go to the IAM service, so you could go to services, and from the services you can have a list of all services that are available, or you can come to the security and identity, and you will find the IAM service is going to be sorted here as an IAM. You could add it to your favorite. If you are doing this lab from the root account, not from the academy account, you could basically create the same environment that we have in the lab sheet, and I will leave a description for it down below. So let us go to the IAM, or you can find IAM from the search bar here. Now, because this is your first lab, you will find Dealing with the management console is a little bit confusing, so don't be confused. You can search, you can go back, you can stop and start the lab at any time. You will find in this lab that we have a three users already created by the lab sheet. Now this AWS student is the current student I'm using to do this lab. So we have user one, user two, and user three. And if you go to groups, you will find also there is an S3 support, EC2 support, and EC2 admin. Let us look to the S3 support. When you go to the S3 support, there is a list of users, and you can see the group is empty at the moment because we will later on add a user to it. And there is the permission tab. Now from the permission, if you expand it from the plus sign, you will find that this user or this group is going to give you the permission Amazon S3 read-only access. Those permissions are pretty made by AWS, so they are not user-defined. Effect of this policy is going to be allow S3 guest list and get and list for S3 object, which means any user we will add to this group, he's going to have a read-only access and he won't be able to upload a file to the S3 bucket. Go back and see now the EC2 support group this is where we will add user 2 and let us look to the permissions 
and from the permission we expand the EC2 read only access the Amazon EC2 read only access policy this is giving a user the allow effect to describe an EC2 to describe a load balancing and also to describe and to list and to get the statistics of CloudWatch so if this user is going to monitor the EC2 instance he needs this kind of action so he can basically monitor the EC2 instance in the AWS Management Console and he has as well the ability to view the auto scaling group if you go back now to the user group there is an EC2 admin group and in this EC2 admin group we have EC2 admin policy in this EC2 admin policy you can click at it here to view in the visual editor of the permission or you could go back and view the JSON. Now in this lab, you should try to practice looking to the EC2 policy itself because later on, when we do the Academy Cloud Architecting class, we are going to study more about those policies. So it's very important to start looking at them and just to feel okay reading this JSON syntax. Now in the EC2 admin policy, we have a, an effect allow to describe to start and to stop an EC2 instance so any user we will add to the EC2 admin he will be able to start and stop an EC2 so let us now add these based on the lab sheet let us implement what is given to us by the lab sheet and you can look to this table here and this table summarizes everything we need to do so in the S3 support we are going to select this group and from add users we are going to select user one so user one he will be able to have access to a c3 read only now from ac2 support group we are going to add user and we will add user two then we go back to user groups and from the ac2 admin group we will select it and then access add users and we will select user three this is will be our admin now we need to test that we have assigned the correct group to each one of those users to do that in the dashboard you are giving the sign in url for any im user you create using this root account now you can look to this as my root account currently so let us copy this link and you can open it in a new window or in, in, in a private session or from a different browser if you need and then paste the link here and this is will give you a request to fill in the username and password now based on the lab sheet user1 password is lab dash password1 and then click on sign now you can see now user one is accessing the management console make sure to change this to the default region that we have in the AWS Academy if you are doing this from root account again you feel free to do it in any region because you have permission to do those and remember that IAM is a global service now we need to go to S3 from this user and we want to verify that this user can view an S3 bucket so as you can see there is a sample bucket here you could try to upload if you want you try add a file to this s3 let us basically add this file here the upload button is going to be down below click on upload and you can see now after a while it will give me an error because i don't have permission to upload or to change the content of anything inside the s3 bucket let's go back to the ec2 now from the EC2 we want to check that this user has no permission and here I'm talking about user 1 he has no permission to view any running instance or to do anything inside the EC2 because he never have a permission to do so now we can sign out and now with the same link if you just copy the same link just paste it again now we sign as user 2 now let us test that this user has an access to SC3 because remember user 2 was giving a permission to access 
uh, the EC2 support group so he has only permission to view uh, the EC2 and you can see it give us an error here that you don't have permission to list buckets so we can go now to test that this user can do um, anything in the EC2 console so let's go to the EC2 we can see there is two instances running and the reason why you can see this because remember you have to go to North Virginia US East 1 and there is two lab host and bastion host let us try now to stop one of these and as you can see I'm giving an error which is correct because I never assign a permission to user 2 to start or to stop an EC2 instance let us sign out let us go back now to the same link that we just copied from the previous step and now put user 3 and the password for the user 3 and then click sign after you click sign just put and access EC2 in instance you can see now the EC2 is there we can view them let us try if we can stop an EC2 and as you can see we are able to stop an EC2 we can also start the EC2 because basically we have permission to do so as well now if you go to the SC3 you will find that this user has no permission to access the SC3 bucket and we will be giving a permission error here as you can see so this is pretty much what you need to do in lab one thank you for seeing this video and see you in the next one Another services that you can use in the cloud security is the AWS organization. AWS organizations is an account management service that enables you to consolidate multiple AWS accounts into an organization that you create and you can centrally manage. The focus of the AWS organization is to create an organizational unit and those organizational units will be used by multiple teams around the globe. The AWS Key Management Service is a service that enables you to create and manage encryption keys and to control the use of those encryption keys across a wide range of AWS services and your application. The AWS KMS is a secure and resilient service that uses hardware security modules that are validated under the FIPS. You can also create in the KMS a customer master key, which can be used to control access to the data encryption keys that encrypt and decrypt the data. You can create a new keys when you want, and you can manage who has access to those keys and who can use them. You can also import keys from your own key management service into AWS KMS, and the AWS KMS integrates with the most AWS services, which means that you can use AWS KMS to control the encryption of the data that you store in the service. Amazon Cognito provides solutions to control access to AWS resources from your application. So you can define roles and map users to different roles so your application can access only those resources that are authorized for each use. Amazon Cognito uses common identity management standards such as the Security Assertion Markup Language, SAML. AWS Shield is a managed distributed denial of service protection service that safeguards your web servers and application that runs on AWS. It provides always on detection and automatic inline mitigation that minimizes application downtime and latency, so there is no need to engage AWS support to benefit from denial of service attack protection. There is AWS shield standard which is automatically enabled to all AWS customers at no additional cost and there is the AWS shield advance which is an optional paid service the AWS Shield Advance provides additional protection against more sophisticated and large attacks for your applications that run on Amazon EC2, Elastic Load Balancing, Amazon Cloud Front, and AWS Global Accelerator, and Amazon Route 53. Let us look now in securing data on AWS. We have encryption of the data at rest. It is an essential tool to use when your objective is to protect the digital data 
and you want to encrypt the data that you have and stored in AWS storage service. Data at rest refers to the data that is physically stored on a disk or on tape. You can create encrypted file system on AWS so that all your data and metadata is encrypted at rest by using the open standard advanced encryption standard AES-256 encryption algorithm. When you use AWS KMS encryption and decryption, these are handled automatically and transparently so that you don't need to modify your application. If your organization is subject to corporate or regulation policies that require encryption of data and metadata at risk, AWS recommends encryption and enabling encryption in all services that store your data. Data in transit refers to the data that is moving across the network. Encryption of data in a transit is accomplished by using the TLS 1.2 with an open standard. You could also use the AWS Certificate Manager, which is a service to enable you to provision, manage, and to deploy SSL and TLS certificates. By default, all Amazon S3 buckets are private and can be accessed only by users who are explicitly granted access. It is essential to manage and control access to Amazon S3 data. AWS provides many tools and options for controlling access to your S3 bucket or object including Amazon S3 block public access, Amazon IAM policies, bucket policies, and access control list, and also the AWS Trusted Advisor, which will provide you with a bucket permission check feature that is a useful tool for discovering if any of the bucket in your account have permissions that grant global access. AWS Config is a service that you use to access, audit, and evaluate the configuration of AWS resources from your management console, and it can be used to continuously monitoring your configuration and evaluate those configuration and review the recent changes. And you can also look to the detailed history of those configuration and you can edit the configuration that was done, for example, in the last. AWS Artifact is a resource of compliance-related information, provide access to security and compliance reports, and other online agreements. And these are available from the management console. So in this lesson, we discuss and define the shared responsibility model. We identify the responsibility of the customer and AWS. And we said AWS is responsible for the security of the cloud and the customers are responsible for the security in the cloud. We describe different type of security credentials. We identify the steps to secure a new AWS account. We explore IAM users and the group and we recognize how to secure AWS data and we recognize AWS compliance a program. Thank you for seeing this video and see you in the next one. Welcome to lesson five, networking and content delivery. This lesson covers the three fundamental Amazon Web Services for networking and content delivery. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, Amazon VPC, and Amazon Cloud Front. In this lesson, we are going to start by looking into networking basics. And then we will discuss Amazon VPC, why we need them and how we can create them. Then we will discuss the VPC security and how Amazon Route 53 is going to work and provide us with high availability across multiple regions. Then we will discuss the cloud front content delivery and I will show you how to create a VPC like a pro and I will ask you to do one lab, which is building your VPC and launch a web server. And we have an activity to do together, which is designing your first VPC. In the classical networking, we normally have each group of PCs grouped into local area network or a LAN. Each LAN has its own unique address in the network to make the communication between multiple PCs possible similar to the internet. So here in this diagram, we have a subnet one and subnet two. And let's say PCA wants to communicate with PCC in the same network. For example, if PC1 wants to communicate with PCC in the same network, it needs to know the address of the PCC so it will receive the message and not PCB. So that we use in computer networking an address schema called IP address. As you can see, each computer in subnet one and two 
has a unique identifier as an IP. Now, when PC A wants to send a message to computer C, he will address it to PC C using its IP 10.0.0.3. And he will include his own IP address if PC C want to reply to PC A the message. Now, what will happen if PC A wants to send a message to another computer in another subnet? Let's say subnet 2 is in another country. In this case, the message will be routed via the internet gateway, which routes the message from one network to another. However, when those messages travel between subnets and network, they need a public identity in order to be delivered successfully to their destination. In this case, an internet gateway put his identity in the message that is coming from subnet 1 and delivered the message to the computer in subnet 2. When computer BCD in the second subnet wants to reply to the message, he uses the internet gateway IP to deliver the message. Then the internet gateway changed the destination address from his own IP to the PCA private IP. This is how network communication work. So we agree that each client machine in a network must have a unique internet to protocol address that identifies it. An IP address is a numerical label in decimal format. Machines convert that decimal number to a binary format. In this example, the IP address 192.0.2.0, each of the four dot separated numbers of the IP address represent eight bits. That means each of the four numbers can be anything from zero to 255. The combined total of the four numbers for an IP address is a 32 bits in binary format. A 32 bit IP address is called an IBv4 address. An IBv6 addresses, which are a 128 bits, are also available. An IBv6 addresses can accommodate more user devices. The reason why IBv6 was invented at the first place is to give any device in the universe a public IP because it has a huge number of available IP equals to 2 to the power 128. If you check that number in the calculator, you will see how large this number is. In fact, it enables us to give every square centimeter in Earth a unique IBv6 address. Because we do not have enough IP in the IBv4 scheme, we have to do two things to have enough IPv4 addresses for the total number of computers available on the internet. First, we use some IPs as a private address in the local area network, and we use some IPv4 addresses as a public IP to carry a message between computers in the internet. Second, we start to use a classless entire domain routing, a CIDR, as we will see in the next class. In CIDR notation, we take the subnet IP and we divide it into two parts. One part used mainly for the network, and the second part we use it for the hosts. See, in this example, we have a digits allocated for host, which means we can have up to 255 different PCs in this particular subnet. From where we got the 255? Count how many digits we have in the example allocated to the host part. We have eight digits, so we can get two to the power eight, which is 256. In this network, there is two IPs reserved. The first one is the network ID, which is 192.0.2.0. This IP is the identifier of the whole network, and we can't use it for an end device or as an IP for a computer in the network. And the second IP is the broadcast IP, which is the IP 192.0.2.255, which means any computer belongs to this subnet, he can communicate with every other computer using that broadcast IP. So let us take another example to understand the CIDR 
better. In this example, we have a subnet ID 10.0.0.0 with a slash 16. This means we have a 16 bits locked for the network and another 16 locked for the host. Now, each digit of those 16 could have the value 0 or 1. This means we can get two possible numbers from each digit, whether 0 or 1. But we have 16 digits of those in total. So the total number of IPs in this subnet will be equal to 2 to the power 16. Hopefully this is clear to you guys. I will be grateful if you like this video and leave a comment if you have any question about the CIDR notation because it is very important to understand VPC and a VPC understanding is vital and important to pass your certification exam. We agreed that an AWS is a data center which contains many resources including your applications, database, email server, and a C3 bucket where you keep your more precious data. All of those resources need to speak with the internet and for this we have something called a VPC, a virtual private cloud which allows you to create a logical isolated section of the AWS cloud and to put your resources and your purchase data services inside your own VPC. Is it clear guys? If not, you know what to do. Leave a comment down below and I will do my best to address your concern. In AWS, VPC gives you full control over networking and which IP address you could use and you are able to create more subnets of the VPC and you can put your resources in those isolated segments of your VPC and we call those segments a subnet. So we understand that a VPC is a logical isolated segment of AWS cloud that you have full control over it, but why? So imagine this scenario, we have an AWS cloud and we are in the EU West 1, the Irish region. Each region is divided into three availability zones. In fact, the Irish region has only a three availability zone. Now we want to create our own segment of that AWS cloud inside the Irish region. So we will create our VPC and this VPC will be dedicated to our AWS account and it will also belong to that region and this spans over the three availability zone. And you can now divide your VPC into smaller segments or subnets. In this case, each subnet will be associated with one availability zone. Each subnet can be classified as a public or a private subnet based on the type of resources you are planning to put in it. Normally, web servers are public facing resource, so they will be placed on a public subnet to enable end user to access them. However, services like database, backend services, email servers, or application server, it is recommended to keep them in a private subnet. When you create your VPC, you will assign to it a CIDR block and this network address you cannot change later. The largest block is slash 16 and the smallest block is slash 28 in the VPC in the AWS management console. A slash 16 address can be used to give us a 65,536 addresses maximum. But a slash 28 is going to give us a 16 addresses only. However, it is recommended to keep your VPC large enough to accommodate future growth of your services and products. When you create a VPC similar with a CIDR block 10.0.0 slash 16, it has a total IP addresses of 65,536, which calculated as 2 to the power 16. Dividing this VPC into four equally sized subnet with a CIDR slash 24 will make each subnet contains a 256 IP address. Now, in AWS, and to make VPC networking work, there is five IP reserved for the use of AWS infrastructure. The first one is reserved for the networking address, the second one for the internal communication, and the third is used by domain name system, which is a service we use as a phone book in your mobile phone. 
A phone book matches name into telephone number. Similarly, DNS matches a domain like Amazon.com to the public IP of Amazon.com server. A route table contains a set of rules called routes. That directs network traffic from your subnet. Each route specifies a destination and a target. The destination is the destination of the CIDR block where you want your traffic from your subnet to go to. The target is the target that the destination traffic is sent through. By default, every route table that you create contains a local route for communication inside the VPC. You can customize route table by adding routes. You cannot delete the local route entry that is used for internal communication. So the summary of this class, a VPC is a logically isolated section of the AWS cloud. A VPC belongs to one region and requires a CIDR block. A VPC is subdivided into subnet. A subnet belongs to an availability zone and requires a CIDR block. Route table control traffic for a subnet and route table have a built-in local route. You add an additional route to the table and the local route cannot be deleted. In the next class, guys, we are going to discuss how we create a VPC, how we create a private subnet and a public subnet. Thank you for seeing this video and see you in the next one. Welcome back. Today, we are going to discuss the methods we use to secure our VPC in AWS Cloud. In this video, we are going to look to VPC networking and security. Let us first discuss the Internet Gateway. We know from previous class that a route table enables our EC2 instances in a private subnet and public subnet to communicate with each other. If the EC2 in the private subnet wants to communicate with the EC2 in the public subnet, the local target in the route table carries the message between them. Also, if the EC2 in the public subnet wants to communicate with the internet, it must use a service called an internet gateway. An internet gateway is a scalable, redundant, and highly available VPC component that allows communication between instances in your VPC and the internet. What if our EC2 in the public subnet wants to access the internet? To do this, we need a service called NAT Gateway. So we understand that a NAT gateway enables your instances in the public subnet to access the internet and to be accessed from the internet. But what if an end user wants to communicate directly with your instances in the private subnets? It will not be allowed. But the instances we have in the private subnets, they might need to do software updates or download a security patches to enable those resources to access the internet. You can do this by adding a component called NAT Gateway to your VPC. When you create a NAT Gateway, you must specify the public subnet in which the NAT Gateway should reside. You must also specify an elastic IP address to associate it with your NAT Gateway. After you create a NAT Gateway, you must update the route table that is associated with one or more of your private subnet to point internet bound traffic to the NAT gateway so that instances in your private subnets can communicate with the internet. Now let us understand how we can add the security layers to our VPC. But before that, we need to understand how communication actually works in computer network. In computer networks, a computer is able to access a web server resources using a model called the client server. The client initiate the request and the server respond to this request by sending the message back to the client. So, for example, an end user wants to access Amazon.com website. In this case, the client of the end user send a request to the web server requesting a copy of the main page. Then the Amazon.com web server receives the request and sends the client a copy of the main website. Now, in the previous example, we have one client requesting one type of content, which is a web content. But what if the client needs also to watch YouTube video or send a new email or upload a file? In this case, the client computer must request the right content from the server 
and it must specify the right port number. So if the client wants to view a web content, then he must send a request to port number 80. If the client wants to view YouTube, it will be also sending a request to port 80 because YouTube is similar to Amazon, both are web servers. If the client wants to send a new email via Gmail, he must send the request at port 25 because this is where the SMTP server operates. If the client wants to upload a file to Google Drive, then he will use his port 21, which is the port allocated to file a transfer protocol. So in the client server model, each service it has its own port number and these different port numbers are standard and they do not change. But why I'm telling you this? For a simple reason. If we build those services inside our VPC in AWS, we have to follow the same standard and we use those reserved port numbers. But how we can do this in AWS VPC? It is very simple. We create a security group and in that security group, we open the port that we need to accept the traffic in that port. In this example, we have an EC2 instance running the Amazon.com website. So we need to open port 80. But how we can do that by enabling an inbound traffic to reach the EC2 instance inside your VPC? It is very simple. By creating a security group and adding a specific rule to open port 80 to accept the traffic from anywhere. A security group acts as a virtual firewall for your instances and it controls inbound and outbound traffic. Security groups act at the instance level, not at the subnet level. Therefore, each instance in a subnet in your VPC can be assigned to a different set of security groups. Security groups have rules that control the inbound and outbound traffic. When you create a security group, it has no inbound rules by default. Therefore, no inbound traffic will be accepted until you add a rule to accept that traffic at a specific port. By default, a security group includes an outbound rule that allows all outbound traffic to go from your EC2 to the internet. You can remove the rule and add an outbound rules that allow specific traffic only to go from your EC2 to the internet. Security groups are stateful, which means that the state information is kept even after a request is processed. Also, when you open port 80 inbound, by default, the reply port 80 will be open. Similar to security groups, we can also control the traffic at the instance level using a network access control list. A network access list is an optional layer of security for your Amazon VPC. It acts as a firewall for controlling a traffic in and out of one or more subnets. To add another layer of security to your VPC, you can set up network access list and you specify rules to allow or deny a specific traffic. A network access list has a separate inbound and outbound rules and each rule can either allow or deny traffic. Your VPC automatically comes with a modifiable default network access list. By default, it allows all inbound and outbound IBV4 traffic and if applicable, IBV6 traffic also. So what is the summary of the differences between security group and network access list? Security groups act at the instance level, but network access list act at the subnet level. Security groups support allow rules only. You can deny a specific traffic in security group, but network access list support both. You can allow and deny a specific traffic. Security groups are stateful. If you open port 80 inbound, port 80 outbound is also open by default. But in networking access list, those are stateless, which means if you want to allow port 80 inbound, you have to add also another rule to allow port 80 outbound. For security groups, all rules are evaluated before the decision is made to allow traffic. For network access list, rules are evaluated in number order before the decision is made to allow a traffic or to deny. 
Let us now practice what we just learned. Try to open a notepad or drawing a software like draw.io. The link to use draw.io to design a VPC will be in the description of this video. You have a small business with a website that is hosted on Amazon EC2 instance service. You have customer data that is stored on a backend database server. You want to keep those data private. So you want to use Amazon VPC to set up a VPC that meets the following requirements. Your web server and database server must be in separate subnets. The first address of your network must be 10.0.0.0. Each subnet must have 256 total IPv4 addresses and your customers must always be able to access your web server and your database server must be able to access the internet to make patch updates. Your architecture must be highly available and use at least one custom firewall layer. And now try to practice what we have learned by building a VPC in the management console of AWS. So in this lab, your task is to create a VPC then you create additional subnets similar to the diagram you are seeing here, and you want to configure a route table following the information that you can see here in the slide, and you want to launch a web server instance. Now, let me show you how you can build a VPC and launch a web server using this demo. To create a VPC successfully, we need to go to the management console, and then we go to the VPC, and from the VPC menu, we have in the left navigation tab, the first thing we need to do is to create an elastic IP. So if you go here to the elastic IP, then you allocate an elastic IP. It's going to be in US East because this is the region where I am located now. Click on allocate. Now go to your VPC. What you could use is the VPC dashboard here, and from the VPC dashboard, you will find the... So to create a VPC after we allocate the Elastic IP, we want to launch a VPC wizard. We select the second option. You can create a VPC with single public subnet if you want. But in this demo, I want to show you how to create a public and a private subnet, similar to what we are going to do in the lab. I'm going to call this demo. Now this is going to be in the first ability zone for my public subnet and the private subnet. And I'm going to use an NAT gateway. My NAT gateway is going to take the elastic IP that I just created, select it, and now click on create a VPC. Once this VPC is ready, you can use it to launch a new instance, to launch a a private instance in the private subnet or a public web server in the public subnet. So my VPC is ready now. So all I need to do is to go and test that I did the right work in this VPC. So I'm going to go to the EC2s. From the EC2, I'm going to launch an EC2 instance. So go to instances, launch an instance, select the first one, which is the Amazon Linux 2 AMI. I'm going to keep the default configuration here. I want to place this in my demo VPC. I want it to be in my public subnet, not in my private subnet. I want to enable auto assign public IP. And here in the user data, I'm going just to paste a demo script that I will leave in the description if you want to try this later on. This is going to install a demo application to test our configuration. Add the storage, add tag, and for the tag here, you can just simply write name, and this name is going to be web server, and now select the security group. This is going to be my web security group. I will add to it port HTTP, and this is going to be from anywhere, review, and launch. I'm going to launch it with the key pair that I have there, and now select on launch. Now this should take a few minutes to be available. Now it is in building a state. So let us wait for this to be can available. All we need to do is to copy the IP address, the public IP address, and test that we can see the demo application. Now the web server is ready. 
go and select it from the checkbox. It will display the details of this web server. Copy the IP address and open a new tab and paste it. You should be able to see the demo application. So this is pretty much what you need to do in order to create a VPC. Thank you for seeing this video and see you in the next one. Welcome back to this class. We are going to discuss Amazon Route 53 is a highly available and highly scalable domain name system. It is used to route traffic from an internet application and translate a name like www.example.com to the numeric IP address 192.0.2.1. It's a fully compliant with IPv4 and IPv6 and it can connect user requests to infrastructure running in AWS and also outside of AWS. It is used to check the health of your resources and it can feature traffic flow and enable you to register domain name system. So in this example here, we have an example website www.example.com and the job of the root 53 when the user sent a request to the C name www.example.com the DNS will match this to the value of the IPv4 or of the type record A that we are going to see them now in the console. In the cloud practitioner, you need to understand the C name, which is the domain name, and the IP address, which is type A record in DNS system. Later on, we can explain more advanced names when we study the solution architecture. However, in Route 53, there is multiple supported routing and we are going to explain each one of those in details because they are very important for passing the exam, both exams, the solution architect and the cloud practitioner. So the first thing we want to do is to see how we can create a domain name in Route 53. So let us now go and create a domain name and I will show you how you can create a domain name for your business and for your organization if you need to have a domain name. As you can see now I am in the management console and I want to go to Route 53. Once I go to Route 53, now Route 53 if you go to the dashboard of Route 53 and you click on get started it will give you all the starting points that you can use to create and to work with Route 53. Now let us say I have an organization, I want to call it AWS Training, and I want to register a domain name for that organization. So I'm going to select register a domain, and then we will click on get started. Now it will give me a list of all the available domain. You can choose the prices per year, depending on your need and depending on your extension. Let's say I'm going to call this Academy. So I'm going to call this AWS a training, and this is will be a domain name dot Academy. Okay. Now I need to check that this domain name is available. If it's not available, it's going to propose different domain names that I could use. It seems to be AWS training dot info, but maybe Maybe it is a bit expensive, so I'm going to change this uh, to something else. Let's call this a free AWS training. So this is going to be a free AWS training. You could call it based on your business that you want to create a domain name for. It. Now you can see free training.net. It will cost me $11 per year. So I could add this to my cart and then I click on continue. And then you specify the details of your uh, payment information to whom this business and domain will be registered. So normally you need to provide your addresses and you click on continue and you check out. Now the next thing I want to show you is basically how we can create a health check. So before we do that, let us have a demo application. And in this demo application, I'm going to use a simple format for my application. It will be an EC2 instance running a simple web server. So let us go now to AC2 and I have it here running on a different system. Let us go now to the AC2 and if you go to my AC2, you will find that I have a demo application running, which is the same cafe application that we used and we, we use in all of my labs and all of the AWS Academy lab. Now this instance is running on this public IP. So if you open this in a new tab, it will give you a hello from a web server. And if you basically pop this extension, which is a mom pop cafe, 
you will find the same interface that we use. And, and as you can see here, the IP address of my EC2, and it is available in US East 1A. Now, what I want to do is to create a health check from root 53, because I'm not sure that this instance is healthy. And once it's not healthy, I might just get an alert to my email and that alert will be sent so I can uh, basically have a secondary hosting zone for my application in a C3 as a static website, for example. So let's go now to Amazon Route 53 from a new tab because I want to keep the EC2 instance to show you later on what I'm going to do with that. Now there is in this particular environment, I have a domain name registered. I'm going to use this for testing and to demonstrate the different routing that we have in Route 53. Let us go to Health Check and we create a Health Check. I'm going to call this primary and this primary is going to check an endpoint and that is the endpoint that I'm going to check here. So I'm going to go back, select endpoint, it's an IP address and the IP address of my EC2 instance, I just need to copy it from here. Now this is going to be my instance IP address and the slash path is going to be because I always reach my website using this slash path. So I'm going to basically put the same here on the path. So I'm going to go back and paste. Now in the advanced configuration, I want this to be fast because I want to show you this as soon as possible. And the failure threshold, which means Route 53 will declare this endpoint unhealthy after two failure of health check. You could also include latency graph and you could basically have a customized matching for your string if you are using an API. We will see this later on with the API gateway. Click next and we want to create an alarm and we want to send this alarm to our email address. This is going to be the channel email address that we use for most uh, demonstration. So let us go back now to our email system and we basically have an existing SNS. We are going to create a new one and we will call it primary AC2 down. Just to let me know that this is not healthy and I wanted to send it to this email and create a health check. Now, after a few minutes, you should be able to receive a notification to your email address saying that you have to subscribe to this topic. Wait for a few minutes until this can give us a value or to show that there is unhealthy instances. So let us wait a few minutes now. We will receive an email to our uh, email address. So I received the email that I have to subscribe to this topic in AWS notification, SNS service. I will confirm. This is all you need to do, guys, just to click on confirm. Now, let us test that this thing is working. We will go to the instant state and we will stop the instance. Maybe accidental deletion of the AC2, maybe an accidental uh, stopping of the AC2 or a crash of the web server. I want to make sure that I will receive an email that telling me my EC2 is not available and my customer cannot see now the website. Could see now this is going to give me 505 very soon. So let us wait and once I receive the email, I will share it with you. As you can see now, the EC2 instance is giving me site cannot be reached and I will wait now for this notification to arrive to my email. Now, how we can prevent that in Amazon Route 53? This is what we are going to discuss in the next topic. We have to create what we call Route 53 routing policy. And the routing policy prevent an accident like this to happen in our infrastructure. And as you can see now, I receive an email saying that your primary EC2 instance is down, which means I have to go back and I will make sure to start and to reboot the instance. Now, let me just refresh the page. Now, I have another instance here. We are going to use it in the demo. We will see that this machine is fully started. So as I said, to prevent such scenario, we have in Amazon Route 53, multiple routing policies. They are supported in Route 53. And we will discuss each one of them and I will show you how you configure each one of those in the management console. We have the first one, which is simple routing. It has a single server environment with single domain. And you want to basically tell root 53 that my domain name, www.baz.ie, awstraining.ie or .com is pointing to this IP address, as simple as that. So let me show you how we can create simple routing. So with simple routing, we have a single server environment. We have our primary, which is an Amazon EC2 instance here. 
and we are just pointing the record which is the www record to a type a record to this ip address this is what we mean by symbol route so let me show you how you can do that i will keep this health check there because we will need it later on you go to the hosted zone and you will find that this record created once we register with uh, root 53 our domain so we're going to select it and we will create a record it will be a symbol routing click next now i want to define a symbol routing it will be ww for this domain name here which is the domain name i register it will be record type a and now the endpoint is going to be an ip address and what is my ip address i want it to be this ec2 instance here the first instance go back paste it and define a symbol routing and create a record as simple as that now once you put and you copy this domain name instead of accessing your website by accessing the ip address i want to be able to access it via the domain name which is what root 53 gave me in specific i want to be able to access this cafe website with all the information as you can see here with simple routing this website now is served from the EC2 instance in US East 1A and this is the IP of the EC2 instance. Now the second type, what we call weighted round roping route. With weighted round roping routing, I have a primary EC2 instance in the first availability zone and I have a secondary EC2 instance in the second availability zone. Now, normally with Route 53, we do this cross multi regions. Why? To guarantee that we have a decent disaster recovery. And the point here with weighted round roping is very simple. We want to split the traffic based on the weight. So, 75% of the traffic, I want it to come to the first EC2 in the first availability zone. And 25% of the traffic, I want it to go to the second EC2 in the second availability zone. Let me show you how you can do that. Let me delete this and make sure when you create a domain name in root 53, don't ever delete the NS and the SOA records. This is the domain name system that you will use with your domain when you register. And this is the authoritative record of your domain name system. Both don't ever delete them. Let us now create the weighted. In the weighted, it's going to be the same. The record name is going to be www. And the record type is an A, which means it's a, an IP address. Could also specify a DNS, other DNS information. You could also specify elastic IP, elastic beanstalk, or elastic load balancer dns name could also specify sc3 bucket if you have your website in a static website hosted in sc3 now we want to define the weighted record so the first definition i want the first ip address which is as you see here in this diagram 54.225.17.0 i want it to take three out of four traffic i want it to come to this ec2 and one fourth of the traffic i want it to go to this ec2 so i will go back copy the ip address of my ec2 instance one and paste it here the weight is going to be three and this is will accept a value between zero to two five five i have a health check which is the primary which can basically help a lot when we define this. Now we need to specify a record ID, Baz, let me call this, and this is going to be W1. And let me define another one. It will be an endpoint, but this time I want that endpoint to take the traffic to my second EC2 instance, this IP, and the weight of the traffic, I want it one out of four. The health check is not going to be any health check because we don't have health check associated with a secondary instance so we're going to call this again baz dash w dash two and define and then you will click on a create and this is will really create a health check for you now this means if you go to your website most of the traffic will be served from the first availability zone unless there is a very busy traffic going to the availability zone a then you will be routed to the second availability zone this is very handy when you have uh, for example a pilot line disaster recovery you have a tiny ec2 instances to support your system and you have your main infrastructure on a premise data center and you want to make sure if there is any issue with your primary to route everything back to the secondary. Now, let me go back and show you the next one. But first, let us delete those. You have to delete them. And this time, I'm going to show you the latency route. 
With latency routing now, Route 53 will decide how to send your traffic based on the latency value we are getting. So if we have, for example, a latency of 125 millisecond going to the primary EC2, then Route 53 will use this link because the secondary is giving us 225 millisecond. How we can define this in Route 53 based on the latency? Very simple. Go back, create a record, choose latency routing, click next. It is again WW. I have an A record type. You could also put the TTL to 15 seconds instead of 300 seconds in order to fast test this configuration. Define it will be an IP address and the same thing we will do. We have an IP address, the primary IP address. Go back, paste it here. In which region? Because the latency record need to test based on the region. Now, if you notice here, I am in North Virginia, so I go back and choose North Virginia. I think you should put US first. North Virginia. I have a primary hill check because this is from where Route 53 will get the latency value. It will get it from the hill check that we did. Let me call this bas-l-1. Then I will add a new latency record. The same thing is going to be for the same region. Now normally, as I said again, Normally, we will have two different regions to deal with Route 53. So I'm going just to copy the same IP address that I have in my second ability zone. And I did no control over this, guys. If I have permission, I will create two EC2 in two different regions to demonstrate this better. And there is no health check associated. Again, this is, will be bas-l latency-2, which is record 2. And then you click on create. Sometimes these records yeah. will now be... with geolocation routing, I want a very simple configuration. I want based on my customer base, I want to route them to my primary or secondary infrastructure. So in this case here, I want the Indian user, my users in India, I want them to come to the first the primary zone, the primary host, the first EC2, and the Irish customers, I want them to come to the second EC2 in the second ability zone. In the same way you do this, you go, you create a record, and you choose geolocation, you put WW, and now the record is A again, and you define geolocation. You choose the endpoint, as I said, the first EC2, in instance one, I want it for my customers in India, and you could choose a continent, you could use a specific country. I'm going to choose a specific country just to show you guys how this is going to work with the primary. And this is going to be Baz Geo 1212. Hopefully, nobody's using the same record ID. And then I want to define another one for my Irish customer. This is going to be the second EC2 instance IP address. I come back here, paste, and this is, will be Ireland and no health check. And this is going to be Baz Geo demo and 3343, for example, and define and create. This is created successfully. Now let me show you. So I said, my Irish customer and my IP now in Ireland, so I should be reaching to this EC2 instance 4.4, which is in my second ability zone. So if I refresh this page, I'm not using the record, guys, and that's why I'm not getting the right value. You need to go to this link here, slash, and you can see I'm getting the response from 1B. Let me show you now. Let me connect to VPN to India. Now, this is a VPN just to test. It's a free VPN, guys, you can use it just to test. Okay, so my VPN connection is active. Now let us test, as I said again, my Indian customers need to come to 54.2255 as well. So if you refresh the page, now you will be asked to go to US East 1A. Again, guys, normally we do this from multiple regions. So that was the thing I'm going to demonstrate is failover. And failover is very simple concept. With failover routing, I want to make sure if my primary EC2 in a sense is down for any reason, I want to fail over to my EC2 in the second ability zone. Now, normally, if you can't afford, depending on your disaster recovery plan, what you could do is to create an SC3 bucket and it will be your secondary hosting of your website just to display a nice message to your user. So let me show you how you can do failover. Now remember, you have to have a health check 
or fail over to work in a proper way. Go to the create record and with fail over, click next. And this is will be WW again with, let me put this 15 seconds because I want to show you this in action. And let us define a fail over. First, is going to be my primary, the record type, and the primary IP I have is this IP here. And the health check is a primary, and again, let me do bands of failover, and let me give a value. Now the second failover is going to happen in the secondary and in the secondary I don't have a health check okay so there is no health check here and this is going to be bas dash dash seven seven eight eight and define oh I forget to paste the IP address so let us go copy the IP and we paste it here I'm sorry that this video is, might be very long for you guys to see but I will leave the timestamp so you can basically go to the section that you are interested in the most. Click on a create record and now my record is there. Let me show you this in action but before I do anything I want to go back to my health check and open it in a new tab. It was 31 minutes ago when I basically turned off the EC2 instance and then it came back down now. The health status is okay. You could also see the latency. The latency was about 100 milliseconds for TCP connection. And this is basically will work and it will be actively routing the traffic between your multi hosting and multi region based on the latency. Let us go and test. The latency. We'll go to the first EC2 instance and we will stop. You will get an email similar to this one, and immediately your EC2 instance will be routed the secondary record to your second EC2 instance. So now this is fully stopped. Let me check. Stopping still. Let me go to my website now and refresh. I am in 1A, notice that, and now it should be changing me, failing over automatically to the second EC2 in the second region or in the second ability zone for our demo. But in general, you should do this infrastructure to, to in different regions. Now, remember I put in the health check, I put 15 seconds, and also in the configuration in my record, I also put the failover with 15 seconds. Just to keep this in mind, the TTLS is basically the time to live how much your content will be cached in the root 53 cache. So if you want a fast response, you want to have a smaller value if you are just testing. But for production, you normally put a higher value like 300 seconds. Let me go back now. It is not available. It was declaring the first a primary hosting of my infrastructure is down. Send me an email and automatically route 53. It failed over to the second availability zone of my infrastructure. The last thing I want to show you is multi-value. And hopefully this will not let me down and it will work. Because with multi-value, I want to configure a method in route 53 to give a different DNS answer for every single request. And this is to avoid a single point of failure. Any hacker who trying to reach and to find out the final IP address of my infrastructure. So let me show you how you do that. Let me delete those first. And now go back and create a record and it will be multi-value. Click on next, the same configuration, WW, A300 and define multi-value answer. It will be an IP address. And the IPs that I have, let me turn on this machine first. I have this IP for my region and I want to get the IP of this EC2 instance in two separate lines will be possible. I could assign a primary check. Now with health check in a place in multi-value, it will use the first record. So it will be good idea now if I keep my primary EC2 IP address in the top. Show me this in multi-value. So I'm going to choose a record and define and decrease. Let me edit this and define a second one for my second AZ. And this is not the primary MU or 889. Define and create. It works magically. I'm delighted. So look back now to my website. You need to refresh this many times to see an effect and now the multi-value answer will start to be in a place with root 53. So root 53 start to give you different responses based on different answers. So let me, for example, open this in a private session. 
I think my VPN is still in a place and in the cache, my VPN is connected and that's why I'm getting this bad multi-value ad. Now I should be routed back again to US East 1B because my VPN enforces and the cache of Route 53 keep telling Route 53, give him the first availability zone. Give him the first availability zone. He is um, requesting the websites from India because geolocation route. With Route 53, you need to work very slowly and you need to allocate enough time to test and to do the experiment. But just to keep this video very short, I'm trying to do my best to wrap it up in this short demo. So you can see now using another browser, I'm getting answer from US East 1B. And this is without VPN guys. From this browser, I'm, I'm getting answer from US East 1A. So this is the point of multi-value answer. So this is pretty much what we need to do for route 53. Thank you for seeing this video and see you in the next where we will discuss CloudFront in more detail. Welcome back. This is an introduction to CloudFront. CloudFront is a globally distributed system of caching server. It caches copies of any requested files, specifically static content, and they can deliver a local copy of those requested content from the nearby cache or a point of a presence. It can accelerate the delivery of dynamic content and improves the application performance and the scaling. It is fast, global, and secure, and it is self-service model with pay as you go. In a CloudFront and the Content Delivery Network of AWS, we have the edge location, which is the point of a presence, and we have the regional edge caches, which are the location where we keep the unfrequently accessed data in the cache. And let us now take a demo about a static website that we have in S3, and we want to enable CloudFront with this static website. Welcome back, guys. We are going to speak about CloudFront, and CloudFront is going to be used with S3 Bucket. We have a static website in S3 Bucket, and we would like to use the content delivery network of AWS, which is CloudFront. So let us create an S3 Bucket, and we will put a static website in it. And that static website, we will use it with the CloudFront. So let us create a bucket. I'm going to call this CDN, my website, and I will make the ownership of the access list enabled. Also, it is a good idea. We need to disable block all public access and acknowledge, and it's a good idea to enable versioning, and then click on create a bucket. We are going to use the same static files that we use for the cafe, so I'm going to upload them now. So we'll upload these files to the bucket i select all of them and drag and drop them to the my bucket and then click on upload When this finish uploading, we are going to basically close this page and now we need to go to properties and from static website we need to enable static website similar to what we did in lab 3 it's going to be index.html the link for that lab is going to be in the video description if you want to refer back to it and now we want to test that this website is accessible and as you know from the previous labs this is not going to happen because i need to do one more thing which is to select all objects and make them public via the access list now refresh the page you can see i have access now to my static website and this is my domain name for the website one thing to do here it is to add an inline bucket policy for the CloudFront to work in a proper way. Let's go back to permissions and in the permissions I need to add this policy here. Similar to what we did in the past which is the policy we normally use for granting a read access for the bucket that we have here. So this is will really grant a read only access and we will change this with the ARN of our bucket. Copy that and save. Let's now go to 
cloud front and in cloud front we are going to create a cloud front distribution so we'll select the cloud front distribution we create a distribution and now the origin of this distribution is going to be amazon s3 bucket which is the bucket we just create select that we're going to to keep everything to the default but just make sure you have http and https we're going to use http for this a cloud front distribution and the idea now we want to fit our images and static file to our static website from a cloud front distribution so we'll take a note now from the distribution name and the next thing is going to be i want to enable our s3 to work with our content and to test that s3 is working in a proper way this is what we are going to do we go back to s3 and to images and i'm going to upload a simple file here i'm going to upload this thumbnail that i use for my videos to the bucket so we will go back and i will upload it here it's called myproject.png and click on upload the next thing is we are going to edit the index.html files based on the new distribution so i'm going to open my index.html and we are going to change the first image which is this image here to the left you can change any image maybe you want to change the about us we will keep it simple and easy for you guys so now my image name is called my project and my project image i want it to get that image from the cloud front distribution so the idea here i need to change this or append the cloud front distribution in front of that so let's go back to cloud front copy this domain here and now i want to paste it in the same way you can remove https because we only have http and click on save and this is the idea why i say to you keep the versioning active in this bucket because you will be able to see what is happening in your pocket when you do this kind of modification and you can roll back to the previous version if needed let me upload index.html again upload now in my cloud front i want to check that it is available which is available and now i want to refresh the page of my website and you can see now it gives me an error why because i have to go back to my bucket i added this image which is not public yet i need to go and make this object public from here you can also select all objects in the bucket if you want now go back to your bucket you should be able to see now the website with the new logo uh, displayed here um, as expected and as you can see this is if you inspect it it's going to be reading this from the cloud front it's not going to be directly read from the s3 bucket and CloudFront is very useful service when you have lots of static and document that you want to cache in the edge location. Thank you for seeing this video and see you in the next one. Welcome back. This is module six of the Cloud Practitioner. And today we are going to speak about compute services, Amazon EC2 and the Amazon EC2 cost optimization and the container services. Then we will look to the uh, serverless computing and Amazon AWS Lambda and Elastic Beanstalk. In AWS, there is multiple services that we can use for the compute layer. And those services, they vary from having an Amazon EC2 where we have basically a server that we can use to launch any service in the cloud. And we have also the container services uh, like Amazon EC2 and Amazon Elastic Container Services, which are a container-based computing instances. We have also an AWS Lambda, which is a zero administration computer platform, where it enables us to run a code without provisioning and managing servers. You can only pay for the compute time that is consumed. And this cost basically will be way much cheaper than running a server 24 hours seven days a week. In the container-based services, including Amazon Elastic Container Service, Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service, and Amazon Fargate, which is a serverless cluster management system. And we have also the container registry of Amazon Elastic Container Registry. 
which can enable us to run multiple workload on a single operating system and those containers spin up more quickly than virtual machine and thus offering a responsiveness and container-based solution to continue to grow in the industry. The first thing we will look at is Amazon EC2. Amazon EC2 is a service to run an elastic compute services. It is the service that provides us with virtual machine to run in the cloud and it gives us a full administration control over the Windows or a Linux operating system that we choose. Most server operating systems are supported including Windows and Red Hat and Ubuntu. An operating system that runs on a virtual machine is called a guest operating system and it is easy to distinguish it from the host operating system because the host operating system is directly installed on the server hardware where we put our virtualization software. With Amazon EC2, you can launch any number of instances of any size into any availability zone in AWS Cloud. And you can control which machine or Amazon machine image that you want to launch in that server. You can control the traffic to and from the instance where you can add an extra layer of security using security group and access control list. The first time you want to launch an Amazon EC2 instance, you will use an AWS management console to launch the instance using the instance wizard. You have to decide a nine key decisions in order to launch the EC2 successfully. And those started from selecting the correct AMI and selecting the correct family that you want to run the EC2 in. So let us look now into how we can launch the EC2 in AWS Cloud. So to launch an EC2 instance, we need to go to the Amazon AWS console. And there in the AWS console, we have to go to the EC2 services. So from the services, we need to select EC2 and then we will click on launch an instance. And the first thing we need to do is to decide which Amazon machine image we have. And we have multiple options. We could use the quick start, which are basically a pre-configured Amazon machines image that is provided by AWS. And we can just select them. And we can have here any operating system of our choice, like Windows or Ubuntu or even any other operating system. Now, most importantly to know here, that you could also launch an Amazon machine image based on your AMI. So let's say you have an EC2, it is running, it has and contains all the software that you need for your application. Then you could go to the Amazon AMI by creating an AMI and you will be use it to basically launch more machines. The Amazon marketplace or the AWS marketplace is the place where you can find a digital catalog of thousands of software solutions that offered by a third party and normally those are paid software. You could also find in the community AMI which are created by people around the world and these can be used and checked by AWS so you can launch your EC2 based on those images in your own risk. Now for the purpose of this demo I'm going to go back to the quick start and I will select the Amazon Linux 2 AMI, which is the first one in the list. So I'm going to select it. And this is, will take me to the second choice. In the second choice, we have to select the instance type. Now, each instance type can determine the memory, the CPU, the disk space, and the disk type, and the network performance. In AWS, we have five categories. We have the general purpose, we have the compute optimized, we have the memory optimized instances, and we have also storage optimized and accelerated computing. Those instance type offer a family generation and sizes. So we have to be careful here in order to know exactly what we are going to launch. For example, if we have the machine, it's called T3. The tree family has a machine starting from T3 Nano, which is a two virtual CPU with a half gigabyte of memory, all the way to 2E3, 2X large, which is eight virtual CPUs with 32 gigabyte of memory. Now it's very important to know that the T family is a general purpose. 
which means the three is the generation number and T3 large, for example, is the size of the machine. For the purpose of this demo, I'm going just to select another family. Let's say I want to have a compute optimized instance. You can find that there is C5.large from two virtual CPU with four gigabyte of memory all the way to C524X large, which is a large machine that we can use it for a huge enterprise application. Now, most importantly, for the free tier application, if we just want to do a simple demo here, we can select the T2 family, which is another general purpose, beside all the other family like M3, M5, M4, which are memory optimized. Sometimes you have a machine which is like M, 5a which means it's a memory optimized it's the fifth generation and also it is a network optimized and m5d is a disk optimized you have also machines which are sometimes a disk optimized and a network optimized so it's depending on your need and your application you can select the right type now for this demo I'm going to select the free tier one, which is the T2 Micro. In the third decision, we have to select now the networking settings for where and how we are going to launch this machine. So normally we need to decide in which VPC we have to select, we have to launch this EC2. By default, you are going to face or to have what we call the default VPC in North Virginia or in the region you are logged in. Then we have to enable or to assign public IP. We can also use the subnet setting for the host name if you are not using a host name with a DNS host name as well. Now the capacity reservation, we can choose the capacity to be determined by or keep it open or we basically select any target group if we have or a target by ID if we have a target group already created in AWS. Later on, we are going to study this in more details. But for today, you could also decide the placement group. And the placement group decided how your machine will be placed. And there is a three options here. Whether you want your machine to be clustered, which means they are going to be in the same availability zone and close to each other. And normally we use this choice if we have a web server speaking with an application server and a database server. Or we want them to be spread, which means each server will be placed in a separate availability zone to avoid any fault or power cutoff in a specific building or in a specific data center. You could also choose partition. And in this case, the group will be partitioned into multi-availability zone in the same region. Now, for the sake of this demo, I will keep this without any placement to group. The IAM role, if we are going to assign a specific profile for that EC2, let's say our EC2 needs to read and write to s 3 so we are going to pass the role here in this field. We could also change the behavior of the shutdown from being stopped to terminated. As you know, the life cycle of the machine, when you terminate the machine, this means will be deleted permanently. If you stop the machine, it will be stopped. So you can change the shutdown behavior and you make it all the time stopped instead of terminating the machine for good. You could also enable hibernation. And with hibernation option, this means that you can save the data that is currently in the memory of the virtual machine if there is a stop action or we change the status of the machine from running to stop. You could also enable protection against accidental termination, especially when AWS do, doing some maintenance, you could prevent that behavior. And you can also enable detailed monitoring. With detailed monitoring, we are going to get, a f instead of five minutes metrics about the virtual machine, we can get a one minute metrics and we can save those CloudWatch metrics in S3 for doing more analysis. The tenancy here, the default is to run it in a shared hardware. If you use for data regulation or if you need for data regulation a dedicated uh, tenancy or a dedicated hardware, you can select whether you want a dedicated instance or a dedicated host. You could also enable Elastic Interface. If you are going to enable Elastic Accelerator to basically improve the machine uh, performance, if you are running a web server in it and you want 
basically to speed up and to keep a static elastic IP there. The last thing we want to do is to pass a user data. And this is a script that will be executed once the machine is started. And normally in this script, we're going to install a specific software in the machine, like a demo application or an application that we use as we are going to see in lab three. In the next step, we are going to decide the storage. And the storage, as you know, it is elastic block storage. And we have multiple type of elastic block storage that we are going to discuss in the next lessons. Now for today, we are going to keep it general purpose. As you notice here, there is a magnetic standard storage. We call this an instant storage. It has very cheap price for temporary data, but it has one single issue. If you stop the machine, all the data in the EC2 instance will be lost. So this means you can't change the type of the EC2 if you choose magnetic storage. You could keep the general purpose at now. You could also add another volume if you need, but at this case, we are not going to add any volume and we will go to the next step where we add tag. And it's very important to add tag in order to keep monitoring the resources and we will know why we create this instance at first place. In step six, we have to configure and to choose the rule that we want to open to control the traffic in and out the EC2 machine. So in this example, I'm going to call my security group a demo security group. And this demo security group, I'm going to enable SSH port and I could enable HTTP port. There is so many ports depending on your need and your application that you can enable. But just for this demo, just to show you, I'm going to enable the HTTP port at port 80. And this is will be open from anywhere. I click on review and launch. The last launch step is going to ask me about creating a key pair. This key pair is going to create a public key and a private key. We are going to download the private key. In this case, it's going to be the key that I'm going to create, which is demo, for example. And I will download the private key into my computer here. And the public key will be installed in the EC2 machine. So every time I'm going to access the machine via SSH, it will compare the private key to the public key. The last step is to click on launch, and this is will launch the EC2 instance. So these are all the options that we need to worry about in order to launch an EC2 successfully. Once you click on a view, you will find that the instance is going now to change from pending to running and you can change the status of the instance from running to start to stop or to reboot or hibernate or terminate now remember terminate in aws means the machine is going to be deleted completely so the instance life cycle once we launch the instances go to the pending state and after the pending state the ec2 is going to go into the running state if you want to stop the instance, you can stop it. If you want to reboot it, you can reboot it. And if you want to start it, you can start it again. Now, it is the time for you to do lab three. In lab three, we are going to do a very simple task. We are going to create and launch a new Amazon EC2. We are going to experience how we monitor the EC2 instance, and we update the security group to access a demo web server and then we will change the instance type and the elastic block storage volume and we will see the limit of the EC2 and we test the termination protection. You can refer to the lab 3 solution in the attached video. Thank you for seeing this video and see you in the next one. Now let us look to the cost optimization of Amazon EC2. Now in EC2, we have multiple pricing model. We have the on-demand instance where you pay by the hour or the second if you are using a Linux operating system, which are not suitable for long-term commitment or a steady workload. They are more suitable if you have, for example, a dev and test environment where you want to create a machine to do a little bit of experiment. We have also the reserved instance, and those are very good if you want to have a long-term commitment for one year or three years, specifically if you have a steady workload. That is steady workload, like a customer, he come to you and he is in business for 10 years and he want to create, move to the cloud 
in this case, a reserved instance will be very suitable because he can get up to 75% discount of the on-demand price. But if it is a startup company and that they want to trial the product and they will see whether the product is going to be successful or not, in this case, the spot instance or the on-demand instance are more suitable. Spot instances are more useful if you are looking to have a emerging compute need for a few hours or a few days and you don't need those images to be or the, those EC2 instances to be for long term. Those spot instances can be interrupted and your price for those spot instances could be outbid by another customer of AWS. For dedicated host, you are going to get a physical server with EC2 instance capacity fully dedicated to your use. Now, normally we use dedicated host to meet a compliant and the regulation requirements, specifically if we have a sensitive data, like we are dealing with data science information. You could also create dedicated instances and those are going to run in your own VPC in a dedicated hardware, not a shared hardware. You could also make a reserved scheduled instance where you can purchase the capacity for one year but you want those instances to be available in a specific days. Like you want the instances from 9 a.m. into 5 p.m. every Monday of that week. So every week you have the machine available to you and you don't need it in the rest days of the week. Now we have to understand that an on-demand instance is more suited for low cost and the flexibility. Spot instances are very good when you have a large scale dynamic workload. Reserved instance, you normally need them if you can predict and you have a def defined capacity need that you want to meet. And the dedicated host, you can basically use it to save money in licensing or you want to meet a compliance and regulatory requirements. Keep in mind, the use cases for on-demand, they are a short-term, spiky or unpredictable workload. Spot instances are more suited for application with the flexibility where you want to start and stop at any time. The reserved instance when you have a steady state or predictable usage. The dedicated instance when you want to have and to bring your own license. For example, you have already purchased a, a SQL Server license and you want to have a dedicated instance so you can install your own license. And this is the only choice where you will be able to access the cores of the EC2 instances and the socket and also you can have per VM software licenses if needed and you can also address a specific corporate compliance and regulatory requirements. In AWS, there is four pillars of cost optimization. Having the right size, where you choose the right balance between the instance type and the application need, and you have the ability to increase and decrease the elasticity, as we will see later on in the last module, when we use auto scaling, you want also to recognize the available price option and analyze your cost and usage pattern in order to have the right mix of a pricing option. I always prefer to have a 20% of my capacity met by an on demand instance and 80% of my capacity needs met by a reserved instance. You could also look to optimize the storage choice, and this is very important to reduce the unused storage or the overhead as possible as needed. You can choose a less expensive storage option. You can have a storage option that met your requirements and the best storage performance. As you saw in the earlier section of this module, AWS offers many compute options. For example, Amazon EC2 provides virtual machines. As another example, we discussed before the use of Amazon Elastic Container Service and Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service, which are a container-based compute services. However, in this section, we are going to focus mainly on the third approach, which is referred to as a serverless computing. AWS Lambda is an event-driven 
serverless compute service lambda enables you to run code without provisioning or managing servers you can create a lambda function which is the aws resource that contains your code then that function will be triggered by any event you choose either on a scheduled base in a response to an event or a code you only run when it is triggered you pay only for the compute time you consume and you are not charged when your code is not running a good example of aws lambda guys is the use of alexa the wake up call when we say hey alexa is going to trigger a code and that code is basically a lambda function with lambda you can use different type of language and tools and the framework lambda supports multiple programming language including java go powershell node.js c sharp python and ruby your code can use any library, either native or third party. Lambda completely automates the administration. It is a fully automated and managed service. It manages all the infrastructure to run your code on highly available, fault tolerant infrastructure, which enables you to focus on building differentiated backend service. Lambda seamlessly deploys your code does all the administration, maintenance, security patches, and provides built-in logging and monitoring through Amazon CloudWatch. Lambda provides built-in fault tolerance. You can orchestrate multiple Lambda functions for complex or long-running tasks by building workflow with AWS Step function. Consider now an example let's say you want to reduce the cost of your amazon ec2 usage you decide that you want to stop instances at a predefined time for example at night when no one is accessing them and then you want to start the instance back up in the morning before the work starts in this situation you could configure an aws lambda and amazon cloudwatch event to help you to accomplish these functionality. And this is what will happen. A CloudWatch event is scheduled to run a Lambda function to stop your EC2 instance at, for example, 22 GMT at midnight. And the Lambda function is triggered and runs with the IAM role that gives the function permission to stop the EC2 instances. The EC2 instances enter the stopped state later at, for example, 5 a.m. GMT. A CloudWatch event is scheduled to run a Lambda function to start the EC2 instances, and the Lambda function is triggered and runs with the IAM role that gives its permission to start the EC2 instances. The EC2 instances enter the running state and this is how we do it in the console so the first thing we want to do is to go to the aws management console you can see there is a serverless application and there is lambda so once we select lambda we want to create a function we need to give this function a name and that function will be a python 3.8 then what we need to do is to configure the function of the aws lambda so in the first task, we are going to configure, after we create the Lambda function, we are going to configure a trigger for that Lambda function. So let us create a function. Now we need to select an existing role. Now if you are using this from a root account, you will be able to create a predefined role. You don't need to select the role that I have here in my lab setup. And now we want to configure the trigger. The trigger is going to link a CloudWatch event using the event bridge with AWS Lambda. So let us select event bridge. And now we want to make sure that we are going to select to create a new role because we don't have any role predefined. The next thing is we are going to put and to create a new rule and that rule every minute we will, where we will schedule the expression and the expression rate will be one minute. So this is more realistic, a schedule based stopinator lambda function, which will be triggered by using cron expression instead of a rate expression. For the purpose of this demo, 
We can use array expression to ensure that the lambda function will be triggered soon enough that you can see the result. We don't need to wait for a long time. Now let us go to the lambda function to the code tab and in the code tab we delete the existing one and we will put the code for the demo. I'm going to make this code available for you so you can download and use it. In this code we need to replace two things. We have to replace the region code and we have to replace the instance ID. And then we need to go back to the EC2 instance in US East North Virginia. And from there, we want to copy the instance ID and we paste it inside the square bracket inside our Python code in the Lambda function. And then we press deploy. And once we deploy the function, we are going to wait for a few minutes to see the result. Now, you could also go to the Lambda and test your code using the test functionality that you have in the Lambda uh, console. And you could also go to the monitoring tab. And from the monitoring tab, you will be able, if there is any error in your code, or if there is any error in the invocation of the function. Now, as you can see now, the function has been invoked for one time in the monitoring tab and we want to go now to the AWS console to verify that our EC2 is stopped by the Lambda function. You could also create a test event and these are very useful if you have a very complex code you want to test before deploying to make sure that everything is working in a proper way. So that's all about Lambda function guys. Thank you for seeing this video and see you in the next one. Now AWS support containerization. But first, what is a container? A container are a method of operating system virtualization that enables you to run an application and its dependencies in a resource isolated process. By using container, you can easily package an application code, configuration, dependencies into an easy to use building block that deliver the environmental consistency and operational efficiency and developer productivity and version control. So in AWS, we have multiple container services and they are supported Docker. But what is Docker? Docker is a software platform that packages software such as application into containers. Docker is installed on each server that will host the containers and it provides simple commands that you can use to build, start or stop a container. Docker is best suited as a solution when you want to standardize the environment, reduce conflict between languages, stack and versions, and use containers as a service. You can run microservices using a standardized code deployment and require a portability for data processing. In AWS, there is multiple services that support containerization. And the first one is Amazon Elastic Container Services, as we are going to see in the next demo. It gives us the ability to manage our container and you can launch one or more AWS EC2 instances and you will install Docker Engine in each instance. Then you will use the Amazon Elastic Container Service as a highly scalable, high performance container management service that supports Docker containers and enables you to easily run your application on a managed cluster of Amazon EC2 instances. In Amazon Elastic Container Service, we can launch up to tens of thousands of Docker containers in second, monitor their performance, and manage their state. And we can also schedule containers by using a built-in scheduler or a third-party scheduler, for example, like Apache, Miss OS, or Blocks. There is also Amazon Kubernetes service, which support an open source Kubernetes software for container orchestration. Kubernetes can work with many containerization technology, including Docker. Because it is very popular in the industry and it is an open source project, a large community of developers are using Kubernetes. So Kubernetes enable us to build and deploy and manage the application at scale. For this reason, we have the AWS Kubernetes service. So you can look at your application as a set of containerization 
that you need to manage in the cluster. With Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service, you can manage those Kubernetes application and Docker containers as a cluster. Amazon Elastic Container Service automatically manages the availability and scalability of the cluster nodes that are responsible for starting and stopping containers. You can schedule containers on a virtual machine. You can also store cluster data and other tasks. The last thing is the Amazon Elastic Container Registry, which is very similar to Docker Hub. With Amazon Elastic Container Registry, it is a fully managed Docker Container Registry that makes it easy for you to store, manage, and deploy Docker Container images. It is fully integrated with Amazon Elastic Container Service, where you can store, run, and manage those container images for your application, and you can specify the repository and the task definition that you want to use. In the next demo, we are going to explain each of those three components to support containerized application. So let us look to the Elastic Container Service. So when you go to the AWS and you look for Elastic Container Service or you select it from the menu, this is, will take you to the Elastic Container Service. And we can see here we have Amazon Elastic Container Service, Cluster, Task Definition, and this is where we can create Elastic Kubernetes Service. And this is the Amazon Elastic Container Registry Service, which is very similar to Docker Hub which is a very popular container registry where you can put your images and these images will be available for the community. Now in Amazon Elastic Container Service, the first step is to create a task definition. So when you go to task definition and you click on a create a new task, you have to select whether you are going to run it in a Fargate, which is an AWS managed infrastructure and it is a serverless computing or an Amazon Managed Elastic Container Service EC2. So let us select for this demo Amazon EC2. And then we click on the next. So for task, let us call this first task. We don't have any role or any network mode that we need to worry about. All we need to do is to add a container. You have now two options. Whether you add a container from Docker Hub, like WordPress, this WordPress here, or you can basically add Another service, let's say in Docker Hub you want to run NGX. So let us now run NGX in container service. You know if you are familiar with Docker, you can pull this image and you run it as a container in your machine. But in this case here, I'm just going to run it as a task in container services in AWS. So let me call this NGX and you need to pass the image. Now the image in this case is going to be NGX and this is will be the latest. NGX is going to get, get me the latest image of NGX. You can specify hard limit, like for example, 102 or 256 megabyte of memory. You can also do port mapping between the host port and the container port, like port 80. You can specify a health check. You can specify an environment variables. And furthermore, you can define the whole container using JSON format, which is the most common way when you want to configure, for example, a task in AWS, you better configure it as a JSON uh, formatted task. So in this stage, we managed to create a task. And the next step, we need to have the family of the task. Now the task family, in this case, we are going to put this container, if you notice here, we are going to put this container in Elastic Container Service. So you could go back to the NGX and you specify what exactly you want to run in this task. So now I created my first task. And the next thing is I'm going to create now a cluster. To create a cluster in Amazon Elastic Container Service, you could go to the clusters and create a cluster. You could go also to the Get Started, which can give you a tutorial of how you can create a sample app or NGX, whether you want it to be in Elastic Container Service or Fargate. Now, in my case, because I have an already a task that I already defined, I want to click on a Create a Cluster. And the option here, we could create a networking only, 
or we could create an EC2 Linux and networking or EC2 and Windows. In our case, we are going to select EC2 Linux plus networking, click next. I will call this my first cluster and I want to run it on an on-demand or an spot instance, I will keep it on demand. And from the instance type, I need to select the T2 micro because these are the free tier one. So T2 micro is going to be more than enough. Number of instances here, I will select one and the size is going to be the root EBS volume is 30 gigabyte. I don't need any SSH key. And in the VPC, I will keep this to the default where Elastic Container Service will create a new virtual private cloud. And then in the container instance IAM, I could specify if I have a specific IAM I want to pass. Now click on a create and this is need an IAM role which is the lab role here and I'm going to click on a create. So this is going to create the cluster and this is will take a few minutes for creating and launching the Elastic Container Service and the EC2 instance. You could go back now to your services or you open the Elastic Container Service in a new tab and here you can see I have previously created a cluster and this cluster is basically running on Fargate. So I could basically run my same task which is NGX in this Fargate cluster. So let me show you how to do that once I have my Elastic, Elastic Container Service ready. So I'm going to run my first task. There is no revisioning and all I need to do is just to run the task. I have to select the launch type and this is going to be Linux. You could go to the first task itself and create from it a modification. So you can basically copy a new version of it and you can make this Elastic Container Service to be running in Fargate and in Linux operating system. And don't forget to have passed the correct role. Now remember here, we are going to have version 2 which is the one we are going to run in Fargate and version 1 we are going to run in and I will specify the memory the minimum CPU and then here I need to specify the mapping of my port and here I just need to expose port 80 because NGX is working at port 80 so now first task 3 is going to run in my Fargate cluster so I'm going to go to the default in the task and I will run as a new task make sure this is a three and I need number of tasks here one I could put here as long as I need like as many as I need this is going to be the default cluster and then I will run the task launch type is Fargate and run a task this is Linux and the cluster VPC is going to be this VPC and this subnet and this subnet and the security group I could edit the security group and I enable port 80 and then I run the task so the task will be running now and you will see after a while that this task is going to be run as a service in the Fargate now if you go back to cluster leave this pending here go back to the cluster and go to the first cluster now my cluster is ready I could go now and run my elastic container service but this time i will put version 2 and this will be running a task as you can see here it is now running so i could look to the task definition and i will find that the ngx is running at this port so if i open this port i could see now this is welcome to ngx and this is running from elastic container service if you go back to my default which is the Fargate, you will find that my task is also running, but this time it is task version 3. If I select it, this is will give me a public IP address, and this public IP address, <coughs> and it is give me a public IP address, and if I open this public address at port 80, I should be able to see NGX. Consider now an example. Let's say you want to reduce the cost of your Amazon EC2 usage. You decide that you want to stop instances at a predefined time, for example, at night when no one is accessing them. 
and then you want to start the instance back up in the morning before the work starts. In this situation, you could configure an AWS Lambda and Amazon CloudWatch event to help you to accomplish these functionality. And this is what will happen. A CloudWatch event is scheduled to run a Lambda function to stop your EC2 instance at, for example, 22 GMT at midnight. And the Lambda function is triggered and runs with the IAM role that gives the function permission to stop the EC2 instances. The EC2 instances enter the stopped state later at, for example, 5 a.m. GMT. A CloudWatch event is scheduled to run a Lambda function to start the EC2 instances and the Lambda function is triggered and runs with the IAM role that gives its permission to start the EC2 instances. The EC2 instances enter the running state. And this is how we do it in the console. So the first thing we want to do is to go to the AWS Management Console. You can see there is a serverless application and there is Lambda. So once we select Lambda, we want to create a function. We need to give this function a name and that function will be a Python 3.8. Then what we need to do is to configure the function of the AWS Lambda. So in the first task, we are going to configure, after we create the Lambda function, we are going to configure a trigger for that Lambda function. So let us create a function. Now we need to select an existing role. Now if you are using this from a root account, you will be able to create a predefined role. You don't need to select the role that I have here in my lab setup. And now we want to configure the trigger. The trigger is going to link a CloudWatch event using the event bridge with AWS Lambda. So let us select event bridge. And now we want to make sure that we are going to select to create a new role because we don't have any role predefined. The next thing is we are going to put and to create a new rule and that rule every minute we will, where we will schedule the expression and the expression rate will be one minute. So this is more realistic, a schedule based stopinator lambda function, which will be triggered by using cron expression instead of a rate expression. For the purpose of this demo, we can use a rate expression to ensure that the lambda function will be triggered soon enough that you can see the result. We don't need to wait for a long time. Now let us go to the Lambda function, to the code tab, and in the code tab, we delete the existing one, and we will put the code for the demo. I'm going to make this code available for you so you can download and use it. In this code, we need to replace two things. We have to replace the region code, and we have to replace the instance ID. And then we need to go back to the EC2 instance in US East North Virginia, and from there, we want to copy the instance ID and we paste it inside the square bracket inside our Python code in the Lambda function. And then we press deploy. And once we deploy the function, we are going to wait for a few minutes to see the result. Now, you could also go to the Lambda and test your code using the test functionality that you have in the Lambda uh, console. And you could also go to the monitoring tab and from the monitoring tab, you will be able if there is any error in your code or if there is any error in the invocation of the function. Now, as you can see now, the function has been invoked for one time in the monitoring tab. And we want to go now to the AWS console to verify that our EC2 is stopped by the Lambda function. You could also create a test event, and these are very useful if you have a very complex code you want to test before deploying to make sure that everything is working in a proper way. So that's all about Lambda Function, guys. Thank you for seeing this video, and see you in the next one. Welcome back. Today we are going to speak about cloud storage. Cloud storage is typically more reliable, scalable, and secure than a traditional on-premises storage system. Cloud storage is a critical component of a cloud computing because it holds the information that application use. 
like big data analytics, data warehousing, the Internet of Things, and databases, and backup and archive applications all rely on some of the data storage architecture. In AWS, there is core AWS services for cloud storage, like Instance Store or the temporary storage that can be added to an Amazon EC2 instances or Amazon Elastic Block Storage, which is a persistent mountable storage that can be mounted as a device to an Amazon EC2 instance. Amazon Elastic Block Store can be mounted to an Amazon EC2 instance only within the same availability zone. Only one Amazon EC2 instance at a time can mount an Amazon Elastic Block Storage volume. There is also Amazon Elastic File System, which is a shared file system that multiple Amazon EC2 instances can mount at the same time. Then we will look to Amazon S3, which is a persistent storage where each file becomes an object and is available through a uniform resource locator. Amazon S3 also provides us with a glacier, which is a cold storage for data that is not accessed frequently. So let us now look to Amazon Elastic Block Store. There is two types of storage options in the cloud. There is the block storage and the object storage. In object level storage, if we want to modify or adjust a small amount of data in the file, the whole file must be updated. Now with the block storage, if we update a tiny block of the data or a piece of line in the data, only that block will be modified. And that's why we use them for enterprise database system or a critical application. Amazon Elastic Block Store enables you to create individual storage volumes and attach them to an Amazon EC2 instance. Amazon Elastic Block Store offers block level storage where its volumes are automatically replicated within its availability zone. Amazon Elastic Block Store is designed to provide durable detachable block level storage. Because they are directly attached to the instances, they can provide low latency between where the data is stored and where it might be used on the instance. For this reason, they can be used to run a database with an Amazon EC2 instance or Amazon Elastic Block Storage volumes are included as part of the backup of your instance into Amazon Machine Image AMI. A backup of an Amazon Elastic Block Storage volume is called a snapshot. The first snapshot is called the baseline snapshot. Any other snapshot after the baseline captures only what is different from the previous snapshot. Amazon Elastic Block Storage volume uses include boot volume, so they can be used to boot the EC2 instance, data storage with a file system, or a database host or enterprise application. Now we have two categories of the Elastic Block Storage volume. We have the solid state drives, SSD, and the hard disk drives, HDD. Matching the correct technology to your workload is a best practice for reducing storage costs and provide us with high performance. Provagent IOPS SSD are a volume that can give you the highest performance. If your application does not require or won't use a performance that is high, then you might possibly use general purpose SSD, which is usually a sufficient choice. Only SSDs can be used as a boot volumes for your EC2 instances. However, you have lower cost options might be a solution for additional storage or use cases other than boot volume similar to throughput optimized or the cold storage which are very cheap. In Amazon Elastic Block Store, because the storage or the volume is a durable block level storage device that you can attach to a single EC2 instance, you can Use Amazon Elastic Block Storage volumes as a primary storage for data that requires frequent updates, such as the system drive for an instance or storage for a database application. You can also use them for throughput intensive application that perform continuous disk scans. Also, Amazon Elastic Block Storage volumes persist independently from the running life of an EC2 instance. 
So let us look now into lab four, working with Amazon Elastic Block Storage. In this lab, we want to create an Amazon Elastic Block Store volume. Then we create that volume and we will attach the volume to an Amazon EC2 instance. Then we will configure the instance to use a virtual disk. We create a snapshot and then restore the data from the snapshot. Just to show you how you can basically manage the data with the Elastic Block Storage volume now let us look to amazon simple storage service amazon s3 amazon s3 is object level storage which means that if you want to change as part of a file you must make the change then re-upload the entire modified file amazon s3 stores data as objects within resources that are called buckets Amazon S3 is a managed cloud storage solution that is designed to scale seamlessly and provides 11 nines of durability. And somebody say, you can afford to lose one document every 200 years. You can store virtually as many objects as you want in a bucket and you can write, read, and delete objects in your bucket. Bucket names are universal and must be unique across all existing bucket names in Amazon S3. Object can be you. <coughs> Object can be up to five terabyte in size. By default, data in Amazon S3 is stored redundantly across multiple facilities and multiple devices in each facility. The data that you store in Amazon S3 is not associated with any particular server, and you don't need to manage any infrastructure yourself. You can put as many objects into Amazon S3 as you want. Amazon S3 holds trillions of objects and regularly peaks at millions of requests per second. Object can be almost any data file, such as images, videos, or server logs. Amazon S3 offers a range of object level storage classes that are designed for different use cases. These classes include Amazon S3 standard, is designed for high durability, availability, and performance object storage for frequently accessed data. Because it delivers low latency and high throughput, Amazon S3 standard is appropriate for a variety of use cases, including cloud applications, dynamic websites, content distribution, mobile and game application, and big data analytics. The second class is called Amazon S3 Intelligent Tiering. The Amazon S3 Intelligent Tiering Store class is designed to optimize costs by automatically moving data to the most cost-effective access tier without performance impact or operational overhead. For a sample monthly monitoring and automatic fee per object, Amazon S3 Monitor Access Pattern of the objects in Amazon S3 bucket and then move them to the intelligent tiering class. There are no retrieval fees when you use the Amazon S3 intelligent tiering storage class and no additional fees when objects are moved between access tier. It works well for long-lived data with access patterns that are unknown or unpredictable. Amazon S3 standard in frequent access. This Amazon S3 standard AI class is used for data that is accessed less frequently but requires rapid access when needed. Amazon S3 standard AI is designed to provide the high durability, high throughput, and low latency of Amazon S3 standard with a low per gigabyte storage price and a per gigabyte retrieval fee. We have also Amazon S3 one zone in frequent access. In Amazon S3 one zone in frequent access is used for data that is accessed less frequently but requires rapid access when needed unlike other Amazon S3 storage classes which store data in a minimum of three availability zone. In this case we are going to store the data in one zone only. It costs less than Amazon S3 standard in frequent access and Amazon S3 in frequent intelligent tiering. It is a good choice for storing secondary backup copies of an, uh, a data center that you have on a premise or can be easily used to recreate data. 
The last class is called Amazon S3 Glacier, and the Glacier is a secure, durable, and low-cost storage for data archiving. You can reliably store any amount of data at costs that are competitive with or cheaper than on-premises solutions. To keep cost low and is suitable for varying needs, Amazon S3 Glacier provides three retrieval options that range from a few minutes to hours. Also, Amazon S3 Glacier has another class, it's called Deep Archive. In Amazon S3 Glacier, Deep Archive is the lowest cost storage class for Amazon S3. It supports a long-term retention and digital preservation for the data that might be accessed once or twice in a year. It is designed for customers particularly customers in highly regulated industry, such as financial services, healthcare, and public sector. You can create a new Amazon S3 bucket very effectively, and you must understand a few simple concepts. First, Amazon S3 store data inside that bucket. A bucket are essentially the prefix for a set of files and must be uniquely named across all Amazon S3 globally. Buckets are logical container for object. You can have one or more buckets in your account. You can control access for each bucket, who can create, delete, and list objects in the bucket, and you can also view the access logs for your bucket. To upload your data into the bucket, such as photos or file, once you create a bucket in an AWS region, then you can use the web interface to upload almost any number of objects to that bucket. In the example above, Amazon S3 was used to create a bucket in the Tokyo region, which is identified within AWS formally by its region code, AP-Northeast-1. In this case, the bucket will have two types of URL, and this URL can be look at them as a bucket path style or a bucket virtual hosted style. And we will see this later on when we use S3 to host a static website. So S3 is a fully managed cloud storage service. You can store virtually unlimited number of objects. You pay for only what you use. You can access Amazon S3 at any time from anywhere through a URL. When you create a lifecycle policy, S3 will manage to move your data from one tier to another, from one storage class to another, based on the aging of the file. So in this example here, you can move the file preview to .mb4. After 30 days, if that file is not accessed frequently, it will be moved automatically to Amazon S3 standard in frequent access. Then it will be moved uh, into Amazon S3 Glacier. And then after 365, you can decide to move the file to the deletion or to delete the file completely. Amazon S3 Glacier, as we said, is a data archiving service that is designed for security, durability, and an extremely low cost. Amazon S3 Glacier is designed to provide 11 lines of durability for objects. It's supports encryption of the data in transit and at rest, and you can create a lock for the valid to enforce compliance through a policy. It is a very low cost design work very well for long-term archiving. There is a three types of retrieval in a glacier. The one is Expedit, Standard, and Bulk. With Expedit, you can expect the file to be in a few minutes. With the Standard, it will be from minutes to hours. With Bulk, you are going to wait for a longer time, maybe 12 hours or more, depending on where you have. You could also use Amazon S3 Glacier with the life cycle policy of s3 so you can move the data into the glacier after a certain amount of days like for example 30 days you want to move the data to glacier and then you move them completely and delete them after five years now what is the differences between amazon s3 glacier and amazon s3 both data volume has no limit the average latency in milliseconds in amazon s3 but the latency time in Amazon S3 Glacier is minutes or hour. The item size is 5 terabyte, a single item in Amazon S3, but a single item in a Glacier can be 4 terabyte of data, 
The cost per gigabyte is very high comparing to Glacier and ST3. You use with ST3 pot, copy, post list, and get, but in Glacier, you only deal with upload and retrieval. The retrieval price, if you can notice here, it's very cheap in Amazon S3, but it is something you need to consider with Amazon S3 Glacier because we saw that there is multiple retrieval option, the standard from three to five hours, the bulk from five to 12 hours, and the expedite from one to five minutes. Now let us look to how we can create a static website for a cafe in Amazon S3. Next, we are going to look to Amazon Elastic File System. Amazon Elastic File System provides simple scalable elastic file storage for use with AWS services and on-premises resources. It offers a simple interface that enables you to create and to configure file systems quickly. Amazon Elastic File System is built to dynamically scale on demand without disturbing the application. It will grow and shrink automatically as you add or remove files. It is designed so that your application have the storage they need when they need it. Amazon Elastic File System is a fully managed service that makes it easy to set up and scale file storage in the cloud. You can use Amazon Elastic File System to build a file system for big data analytics, media processing workflows, content management, web serving, and home directories. You can create file systems that are accessible to many Amazon EC2 instances. And also you can use that file system with the ability for Linux and Windows as it support NFS and Windows file server. Now let us look to an introduction to Amazon Elastic File System, how we can use it and how we can mount the file system, the Elastic File System to an Amazon EC2 instances. Thank you for seeing this video and see you in the next one. Welcome back guys, we, we do in this lab, uh, the guided lab introduction to Amazon Elastic File System. Just to explain a few things here, in this lab we will do access the management console, we will create an Amazon Elastic File System, and then we will try to mount that Elastic File System into an Amazon EC2 and then we will test the performance of the file system. So now the first thing in this lab is to go to the AC2 console. And from the AC2 console, we want to go to the security group. But before doing that, just let me show you exactly why we need to do this. We have a running Elastic File System client. You will find that there is a security group for the AC2 instance. That security group for the AC2, it will be the source of the communication into our security group that we will attach to the Elastic File System. So going back into step number eight, step number seven, it's asking us to copy the security group ID. So I'm going to copy that ID and I'll save it here in my text editor. Now I want to go back and from security group, I need to create a new one. And that security group, it should have the mount target, which means I'm going to use it for mounting the target. I will copy the description and most importantly, don't forget to select that this is going to happen in the lab VPC. We will add a rule and this rule is going to be the NFS. Now the source of the traffic is going to be the EC2 security group. So it will be the EC2 client, whether you select from here or you copy security group that we just copied from the previous uh, step. Just create a security group and that security group will be used once we create the file system. Now in the next task we will create an elastic file system. So we are going to go to the elastic file system console and then we create a file system, click on customize. 
Now this is, will be a regional by default. You can also select it to be in a one zone if needed. But for this lab, we're going to select it regional. In the step 12 and 13, they are asking us to uncheck automatic backup and none for the transition or the life cycle policy. Then we need to put a tag in the name here and that tag will be named my first elastic file system name let me copy this from here just to make sure i put the right tag now in which vpc it's going to be in our lab vpc now in our lab vpc as we did in the previous labs it has a public and a private subnet one and two and we have a public and a private subnet two i'm going to select lab vpc to be in a private subnet and this is where we normally mount the elastic file system unless our application needs something to access the file system from a public subnet however in this scenario here i need to make sure that i select the correct security group and this is where the confusion came in this lab so whether you are going to mount the Elastic File System Client, which is basically the EC2 security group, which is not correct in this case, but we are going to use the Elastic File System mount target. And we are going to use it in both mount target. Now click in Next, and then Next, and then Create. At this step here, my first file system is created successfully. I should be able to carry on with the lab. Now in the next step, we are going to connect to the AC2. So feel free to follow this step if you are using Windows or if you are having a Mac. However, I'm going to use this terminal to connect. As I showed you before, the lab user Vocarium key is located in this folder, CD, in the .ssh folder. So if you do ls, you will find that this lab user .pem file is already existed in our system. To connect to it, to our EC2, we need to go back to our EC2 console and from our instances, we have a running EC2 here. Copy the public IP minus I, pass the name of the pen file, EC2 user, which is the default username for the Amazon Linux AMI, right click and paste the IP address. Click enter, click yes, and now I am able to connect to the EC2 machine. So you can skip all these steps all the way to task four, where we need to create a new directory to mount the file system into our system. So the first thing we need to go in step 40 is to go to the Elastic file system again. and select the file system we want to mount, and then attach. Now the attach via DNS is going to give us a few, uh, basically a few uh, commands to run. In this particular scenario here, they are going to ask us to install the Amazon Elastic File System utility. However, these should be installed by default in Amazon Linux 2, but just to be sure, paste and enter. Now, in step 42, we need to create a new folder called Elastic File System. You could call this folder anything, but for the sake of this scenario, we're going to make it the default, which is sudo make directory Elastic File System. And now going back to the instruction, we can use the NFS client, not the NFS mount helper. So we'll copy this command and we paste it again in the console. Now this should take a few minutes, and once we finish, we can get a summary of the available disk space that we have, including 
the noun target we just create of our elastic file system. So you could verify this using the command df minus h t capital. We would like also to run flexible IO, which is like a benchmarking tool for Linux, just to see how our file system is behaving. So I'm going to copy this command here and paste it in the new terminal here that I have. And this is will basically uh, generate some output to the file system so we can catch performance of our file system from the CloudWatch. The next thing is to basically go back to the services in our file system, which copy this, and now we need to monitor the performance of our file system so you can see more in CloudWatch. This will take us to the file system monitoring page or there, the lab instruction. You need to go to the Elastic File System from here, then select File System for all metrics, and we get the file system performance. And we need to select the primitive throughput, which is this guy here. And this is will show us the current performance of our file system. You could also finish the navigation in the cloud for a watch based on step number 56. And you can also um, uncheck the box and select all of them and change the graph, for example, to stacked area or numbers or even bars based on your needs, based on your preference. So that's it for this lab. Thank you for watching this video and see you in the next. Welcome back. We are going to speak today about relational database. In this lesson, you will learn and understand the different database services in AWS Cloud, and you will discover the differences between unmanaged and managed database solution. Then we will understand the difference between structured query language and NoSQL database. Then we will compare the availability differences of alternative database solution. In AWS, you can have two types of category of database system, whether you choose unmanaged or managed services. In unmanaged services, you will be responsible for scaling, fault tolerance, and availability of the database system. In managed services, scaling, fault tolerance, and availability are typically built in into the services, or we call them a platform as a service. So let us look to the challenges of running a relational database database system on a premises data center. When you run your own relational database, you are responsible for several administrative tasks such as server maintenance, software installation and patching, database backups. You are also responsible for ensuring high availability and the planning for scalability. The data security and operating system on installation and patching, all of these tasks is your responsibility. Amazon RDS is a managed service that sits and operates a relational database in the cloud. You manage the application optimization and AWS manages the OS installation and the patches, database software installation and patches, database backup, high availability, scaling, the power and racking and stacking of the servers and the server maintenance. In AWS RDS, you have multiple options to create a database instance. Your database instance is an isolated database in environment that can contain multiple user created database. It can be accessed by using the same tools and application that you use with a standalone database instances. The resources in a database instance are determined by its database instance class and the type of storage is dedicated for your database instance. Database instances and storage differ in performance characteristics and the pricing model of them, which enable you to customize your performance and cost to the needs of your database. When you choose to create a database instance, you must first specify which database engine to run. Amazon RDS currently supports six databases engine, MySQL, Amazon Aurora, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, MariaDB, and Oracle database. You can create in RDS a highly available database multi-AZ deployment. One of the most powerful features of Amazon RDS is the ability 
ability to configure your database instance for high availability with a multi-AZ deployment. After multi-AZ deployment is configured, Amazon RDS automatically generates a standby copy of the database instance in another availability zone within the same VPC. After seeding the database copy, transactions are synchronously replicated to the standby copy. Running a database instance in multi-AZ deployment can enhance the availability during planned system maintenance and it can help protect your database against database instance failure and availability zone disruption. It is very important to understand when we need to use and when we don't need to use an RDS. You use Amazon RDS when your application requires a complex transaction or a complex query which means it's dealing with a structured query language with a relational database system where there is relationship between entities. When you have a medium to high query or write rate up to 30,000 or 15,000 reads plus 15,000 writes. When you have more than one single worker node or shard, you are not using shard. In this case, you can use RDS. If you are using shard, then you have to go and install your own database system. And when high durability is a must in your application. You don't use Amazon RDS when your application requires a massive read or write, for example, 150,000 writes per second. When sharding is mandatory in your application because you have to use your own sharding technique with your database system. When you need to deal with your data using a simple get or pot request and it queries the data with no SQL database system or a relational database management system which is a very customized. So if you have a customized version of a database engine that you need to install, in this case, you have to go and install your own database system. Now let us look into lab 5. In lab 5 we are going to learn how we can create and build our DB server and then we will launch and configure a web application to interact with the DB server. So the lab tasks are you create a VPC, then you create a DB subnet, then you create an Amazon RDS DB instance. The final product of the lab will look to the following diagram that you can see here in this video. Now the full solution solution for this lab is also can be seen in the demo. Amazon Aurora is another product of AWS. So what is Amazon Aurora? Amazon Aurora is a MySQL and Postgres SQL compatible relational database that is built for the cloud. It combines the performance and availability of high-end commercial databases with the simplicity and cost effectiveness of open source database. You can use Amazon Aurora to reduce your database cost while improving the reliability and availability of the database. As a fully managed service, Aurora is designed to automate time-consuming tasks like provisioning, patching, backup, recovery, failure detection, and repair. Amazon Aurora has several features. In Amazon Aurora is a highly scalable performance and cost-effective managed relational database. Aurora offers a distributed high-performance storage subsystem. Using Amazon Aurora can reduce your database cost while improving the reliability of the database. Aurora is also designed to be highly available. It has fault-tolerant and self-healing storage built for the cloud. Aurora replicates multiple copies of your data across multiple availability zones and it continuously backs up your data to Amazon S3. In Amazon Aurora, you have multiple levels of security which are available, including network isolation, your own Amazon VPC, encryption for the data at rest by using keys that you create and control through AWS Key Management Service and you can also encrypt the data in a transit by using a secure socket layer. Amazon Aurora Database Engine is compatible with existing MySQL and Postgres open source database and adds compatibility for new releases in a regular basis. Amazon Aurora is a fully managed by Amazon RDS. Aurora automates database management tasks such as hardware provisioning, software patching, setup configuration or backup of the data. Database. Now let us look to Amazon DynamoDB. In Amazon DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL database, so what is the difference between relational and non-relational databases? A relational database, RDS, works with structured data that is organized by table, records, and columns. RDS establish a well-defined relationship between database table, like a teacher teaches many students, a student are taught by one teacher. We use normally as structured 
structured query language to query the database, which is the standard user application and to provide a programming interface for the database. With a relational database, you might have difficulty scaling out horizontally or working with semi-structured data, which means you have to think about a non-relational database. A non-relational database is any database that does not follow the relational model that is provisioned by traditional relational database management system. Non-relational database have grown in popularity because they were designed to overcome the limitation of relational database for handling the demand of variable structured data. Non-relational database scales out horizontally and they can work with unstructured and semi-structured data. In Amazon DynamoDB, we can create a flexible and fast, highly scalable with virtually unlimited storage where item can have differing attribute with low latency querying where you have the ability to scale the read and write through. The core component of DynamoDB are tables, items, and attributes. Items are a group of attributes that is uniquely identifiable among all other items. Attributes are fundamental data element, something that does not need to be broken down any further. DynamoDB support two different kinds of primary keys. The partition key, which is a simple primary key, which is composed of one attribute called the sort key, and the partition key and the sort key are also known as composite primary key, which is composed of two attributes. Now let us look to Amazon Redshift. Amazon Redshift is a fast, fully managed data warehousing that makes it simple and cost effective to analyze all your data by using standard SQL and your existing business intelligence tool. Analytics is important for business today. Building a data warehousing is a complex and expensive. Data warehouses can take months and significant financial resources to set up. With Amazon Redshift, it's a fast and powerful fully managed data warehousing that is simple and cost effective to set up, use, and scale. It enables you to run complex analytics query against petabyte of structured data by using sophisticated query optimization, columnar storage on high performance local disk, and massively parallel data processing. Most results come back in second. Amazon Redshift contains two types of nodes. We have the leader node, which manages communication with the client programs and all communication with compute nodes. The compute nodes parse and develop the plans to carry out database operations, specifically the series of steps that are needed to be obtained the result of a complex queries. The leader node compiles code for individual elements of the plan and assigns the code to individual compute nodes. Compute node run the compiled code and send an intermediate results back to the leader node for final aggregation. Like other AWS services, you only pay for what you use. You can get started for as little as 25 cents per hour and at scale, Amazon Redshift can deliver storage and processing of approximately $1,000 per terabyte per year. So Amazon Redshift is a fast fully managed data warehousing service, easily scale with no downtime. It supports columnar storage and parallel processing architecture and automatically and continuously monitor a cluster and decryption is a built-in feature. Thank you for seeing this video and see you in the next one. Welcome back. Modern high traffic websites must serve hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of concurrent requests from users or client, and then return the correct text, images, video, or application data in a fast and reliable manner. Additional servers are generally required to meet these high volumes. Elastic load balancing is an AWS service that distributes incoming application or network traffic across multiple targets, such as Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud instances, container, internet protocol addresses, and Lambda function in a single availability zone or across multiple availability zones. Elastic load balancing scales your application as the traffic to your application changes over time. It can automatically scale to most 
workload. Elastic load balancing is available in three types. An application load balancer operates at the application level. It routes traffic to target. Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, Containers, Internal Protocol, IP Addresses, or Lambda Function. Based on the content of the request, it is ideal for advanced load balancing of hypertext transfer protocol and secure HTTPS. An application load balancer provides an advanced request routing that is targeted at delivery of modern application architectures including microservices and container-based application. An application load balancer simplifies and improves the security of your application by ensuring that the latest secure socket layer, transport layer security, and the protocols are used. The second type of load balancing is a network load balancer. It operates at the network transport layer, routing connections to target like EC2 instances, microservices, and container based on IP protocol data. It works well for load balancing both transmission control protocol TCP and UDP traffic. A network load balancer is capable of handling millions of requests per second while maintaining an ultra low latencies. A network load balancer is optimized to handle sudden and volatile network traffic patterns. The third type, a classic load balancer, provides basic load balancing across multiple EC2 instances and it operates at both the application layer and the network layer. A classic load balancer supports the load balancing of applications that use HTTP, HTTPS, TCP and SSL. The classic load balancer is an older implementation and when possible you can replace it with modern dedicated application load balancer or a network load balancer. But sometimes we still need it to support HTTP, HTTPS and TCP and SSL protocol in the same app. Application. So how elastic load balancing works? A load balancer accepts incoming traffic from clients and routes requests to its registered targets such as Amazon EC2 instances in one or more availability zone. You configure your load balancer to accept incoming traffic by specifying one or more listeners. A listener is a process that checks for connection requests. It is configured with a protocol and port number for connections from clients to the load balancer. In similar way, it is configured with a protocol and port number for connections from the load balancer to the targets. You can also configure your load balancer to perform health check, which are used to monitor the health of the registered targets so that the load balancer only send requests to the healthy instances when the load balancer detects an healthy target. It stops routing traffic to that target and then resume routing traffic to the healthy target. There is a key difference on how the load balancer are configured. With application load balancer and network load balancer, you register the target in target groups and route traffic to those target groups. With a classic load balancer, you register in instances with the load balancer. The use cases for load balancing. It can be used to achieve high availability and better fault tolerance for your application. It can automatically load balance your containerized application. It can automatically scale your application. And if you can use elastic load balancing in your virtual private cloud to enable hyper load balancing, elastic load balancing enable you to load balance across multiple AWS availability zone and on-premises data center. You could also use it to invoke Lambda function over HTTP or HTTPS. Elastic load balancing support that Lambda function to serve the request and enable user to access serverless application from any HTTP client. Now let us look to the monitoring service of AWS, which is a CloudWatch. So to monitor your AWS resources efficiently, you need insight into your AWS resources. For example, you might want to know when you should launch more EC2 instances, 
if your application performance or availability is being affected by a lack of sufficient capacity, how much of your infrastructure is actually being used. You can capture this information with Amazon CloudWatch. CloudWatch enable you to monitor and observe servers built in the AWS. It is a tool built for DevOps engineers, developers, and site reliability engineers and IT manager. CloudWatch monitor your AWS resources and the application that runs on AWS in real time. You can use CloudWatch to collect and track metrics which are variable that you can measure off for your resources and application. You can create an alarm to monitor any Amazon CloudWatch metric in your account and you can use that alarm to send a notification to Amazon Simple Notification Service, SNS, or perform an Amazon EC2 auto scaling or Amazon EC2 action. You can also use Amazon CloudWatch events to define rules that match incoming events or changes in your AWS environment, and you route them to target for processing. You can create a CloudWatch alarm that watches a single CloudWatch metric or the result of a math expression based on a CloudWatch metrics. You can create a CloudWatch alarm based on a static threshold. Let's say you want to check if the CPU utilization reach 60% or anomaly detection. So CloudWatch will monitor the behavior of the system and if there is anomaly detected, that will cause an alarm. You could also put a mathematical expression to calculate different metrics all together. Now let us look to Amazon EC2 Auto Scaling. When you run your application in AWS, you want to ensure that your architecture can scale to handle changes in demand. In this section, you will learn how to automatically scale your EC2 instances with Amazon EC2 Scaling. Scaling is the ability to increase or decrease the compute capacity of your application to understand why scaling is important. Consider an example of a workload that has a varying resources requirement. The most resources capacity is required, for example, in a Wednesday and the least resources capacity required on Sunday. The one option that you could have and to maintain enough capacity with those variable demands is to use an automatic auto scaling. Auto scaling help you to maintain the application availability and enables you to automatically add or remove EC2 instances according to conditions that you define. You can detect any impaired instances and healthy and a healthy application and replaces those instances without any human intervention. In auto scaling, there is several scaling options. There is the manual one, the scheduled, the dynamic, or on demand, and the predictive one. So an auto scaling group is a collection of EC2 instances that are treated as a logical group for the purpose of automatic scaling and management. You have two types of scaling. You have the scaling in and the scaling out. With the scaling in, you are going to reduce the amount of resources that you have, you terminate the instances, and with the scaling out, you increase the number of EC2 instances to meet a demand. So how Amazon EC2 auto scaling works? To launch an EC2 instance, an auto scaling group use a launch configuration or a template, and that launch configuration will specify the AMI that it will be used, the instance type, whether there is an IAM role or a security groups and the elastic block storage volume that it can be used. Then you define the minimum and the maximum number of instances and the desired capacity of your auto scaling group. You launch it into a subnet within your VPC. Amazon EC2 Auto Scaling integrates with Elastic Load Balancing to enable you to attach one or more load balancer to an existing auto scaling group. After you attach a load balancer, it will be automatically registers the instances in the group and distribute incoming traffic across the instances. Finally, you specify when you want the scaling events to happen. 
you have many scaling options, whether you're maintaining the current instance level at all time, or you do a manual scaling by specifying only the changes in minimum, maximum, and desired capacity of your auto scaling. You could also schedule the scaling action so you can automatically perform based on a function of date and time. Or you can use dynamic on demand scaling, which is a more advanced way to scale your resources to enable you to define parameters that control the scaling process. Like, for example, you check the CPU utilization, and once the CPU utilization reaches 60%, you will scale out. You add more EC2 instance. And if the CPU utilization is a below 20%, then you scale in and you terminate instances. You could also use an Amazon Auto Scaling Predictive Scaling Policy, which can used to predict the demand based on the history of your data, and it uses those data in order to predict the future demand based on your infrastructure. And based on that predictive, using machine learning model, it will predict the expected traffic, and this will trigger the scaling of adding one or more machines or terminate machines based on those prediction models. One common configuration for implementing dynamic scaling is to create a CloudWatch alarm that is based on performance information from your EC2 instances or load balancer. When a performance threshold is breached, a CloudWatch alarm triggers an automatic scaling event that either scales out or scale in EC2 instances in the auto scaling group. To understand how it works, consider this example. You create an Amazon CloudWatch alarm to monitor the CPU utilization across your fleet of EC2 instances, and you run automatic scaling policy if the average CPU utilization across the fleet goes above 60% for 55 minutes because you need to take a longer period of time to make sure there is a spike in the CPU, not a sudden immediate volatile spike. Then an Amazon Auto Scaling initiate a new EC2 instance into your IC2 group in your Auto Scaling group based on the launch configuration that you create. After the new instances is added, Amazon EC2 Auto Scaling makes a call to Elastic Load Balancer to register the new EC2 instance in that auto scaling group. Elastic Load Balancing then performs the required health check to start the traffic distribution to the newly added EC2 instances in the group. So AWS Auto Scaling is a separate service that monitors your application. It automatically adjusts capacity to maintain steady predictable performance at the lowest possible cost. The service provides a simple powerful user interface that enables you to build a scaling plan for your resources including Amazon EC2 instances, container services, DynamoDB, and Aurora replica. Now let us look to lab 6. In lab 6, you will create an Amazon machine image AMI from running instances, you create an application load balancer, you create a launch configuration and auto scaling group, and you automatically scale the instances within a private subnet, and you create an Amazon cloud watch alarm and monitor the performance of your architecture. So the final diagram of this lab is showing here in this slide, and you could also look to the full solution of lab 6 in this demo, where you can see me doing that final product of the lab. Thank you for seeing this video, and see you in the next one. Welcome back. In this module, we are going to look to the well-architected framework and the Amazon Web Services well-architected framework. Then we will look to the best practices for building solutions on AWS and the AWS Global Infrastructure. By the end of this course, you will have learned about all component in the AWS architecture, and this will enable you to build a similar architecture showing here in the example. You should also be able to construct your own solution architectures that are as large and robust as this example. You will see this diagram repeated at the start of most modules in this course and lesson. A new component in this diagram will be revealed 
as they are introduced in the course. So what is cloud architecting? Cloud architecture is the practice of applying cloud characteristics to a solution that uses cloud services and features to meet an organizational, technical needs, and business requirements. A solution is similar to a blueprint for a building. Software systems require architects to manage their size and complexity. The cloud architects engage with decision makers to identify the business goals and the capabilities that need improvement. Ensure alignment between technology deliverables of a solution and the business goals. Work with the delivery teams that are implementing the solution to ensure that the technology features are appropriate. The AWS Well Architected Framework is designed to help you to build the most secure, high-performing, resilient, and efficient infrastructure. It provides a constant approach to evaluate cloud architectures and guidance to help implement designs. It documents a set of foundational questions and best practices that enable you to understand if a specific architecture aligns well with the cloud best practices. AWS developed this framework after reviewing thousands of customer architectures on AWS. The five pillars of the well architected framework are operational excellence, security, reliability, performance, efficiency, and cost optimization. In the security pillar, we address the ability to protect information, systems, and assets while delivering business value through risk assessment and mitigation strategies. Your architecture will present a much stronger security presence if you implement a strong identity foundation and enable traceability via cloud trial and apply security at all layers. Then you want to automate the security best practices and protect the data in a transit and at rest. In the operational excellence pillar, we want to look to the ability to run and monitor the system via, for example, CloudWatch. And we want also to continuously improve supporting processes and procedures. In the reliability pillar, we want to recover quickly from infrastructure or service disruption, and we can be able to dynamically acquire computing resources to meet the demand. Then we should have a mitigation disruptions such as misconfigurations and transit network issues. In the performance efficiency pillar, we want to choose efficient resources and maintain their efficiency as demand changes, and we want to employ and implement advanced technologies, and we want to also employ mechanical sympathy. In the cost optimization, we want to measure the efficiency of our system and software and eliminate unneeded expense. We want to consider using managed service over self-managed service. If you would like help with designing a well-architected solution, you can use the well-architected tool. The AWS Architected Tool is a self-service tool that provides you with an on-demand access to current AWS best practices. These best practices can help you to build secure, high-performing, resilient, and efficient application infrastructure on AWS. The AWS Well-Architected Tool helps you to review the state of your workload and compare them to the latest AWS Architected service practice. You have access to the tool via the management console and you can define your workload and you can answer a series of questions in the area of operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. So what are the best practices for building solutions on AWS? As you design a solution, think carefully about the trade-offs so that you can select an optimal approach. For example, you might trade consistency, durability, and the space for time and latency to deliver higher performance. Or you might prioritize the speed uh, to market over cost. Trade-offs can increase the cost and complexity of your architecture. So your design decision should be based on empirical data. You might need to perform load testing to ensure that a measurable benefit is 
obtained in the performance or you might need to perform benchmarking to achieve the most cost optimal workload over time when you evaluate performance related improvements you will also want to consider how your architecture design choices will impact customer and workload efficiency when you run your workload in the aws cloud you can scale your infrastructure quickly and dynamically using an auto scaler this will make sure that you implement the scalability at every layer of your infrastructure in the scenario that we can see here when application server reach full capacity users are prevented from accessing the application in this case in the anti-pattern the administrator must manually launch a new server to meet those demand. This might take a few minutes for an instance to become available for use after its launch, which can increase the time that user cannot access the application. By enabling auto scaling, you can improve your design to anticipate the need for more capacity and deliver it before it is too late. AWS offers built-in monitoring and automation tool at virtually every layer of your infrastructure. Take advantage of these tools to ensure that your infrastructure can respond quickly to changes. You can also use those tools like CloudWatch and Amazon EC2 Auto Scaling to detect unhealthy resources and automate the launch of replacement resources. You can also be notified when resources and locations changes the best practices of treating resources as a disposal refers to the idea of thinking about your infrastructure as software instead of hardware with hardware it is easy to buy more specific component that you need so with hardware it is easy to buy more specific components that you need so that you are prepared for spikes in usage that is expensive and inflexible it is harder to upgrade because of the cost when you treat your resources as disposal migrating between instances or other discrete resources is fairly straightforward you can quickly respond to changes in capacity needs upgrade applications and manage the underlying software traditional infrastructure have chains of tightly integrated server each with a specific purpose the problem is that when one of these components or layers goes down the disruption to the system can be fading it also make the scaling very difficult if you add or remove servers at one layer you must also connect every server on each connecting layer so the example in the left demonstrate a collection of web and application server as you can see if one of the application server goes down the tightly coupled web server will be also down which means you won't be able to fix only the application but you have also to fix and maintain and configure both the application server and the web server with loose coupling you can use managed solution as a load balancer between the application and the web layer and in this case you can change all these unhealthy instances by a healthy application server and this is will not affect the performance of your web server the next best practice is design services not servers Although Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud offers tremendous flexibility for designing setting up your solution, it shouldn't always be the first option. There is many other choices like containers or serverless solution which can be more appropriate to your application. With AWS serverless solution and managed services, you don't need to provision, configure and manage an entire Amazon EC2 instances and with managed solution that have a lower profile and are more performance can replace server-based solutions at a lower cost. We will describe a few examples of AWS Lambda and AWS simple queuing service sqs and amazon dynamodb and the elastic load balancing and also we will look to the amazon simple email service and amazon cognito choosing the right database solution is very important for your application in its traditional data centers and on-premises environments limits on available hardware and licensing can constrain your choice of a data store solution aws recommends that you choose a data store based on your needs for your application environment where possible eliminate single point of failure from your architecture this does not mean that you must always duplicate every component depending on your downtime service level agreement you can use an automated solution that only launch the component when needed a common way to avoid single points of failure is to create a secondary standby database server and replicate the data 
in a synchronous method. This way, if the main database server goes offline, the secondary server can pick up the load. Cloud computing allows you to trade capital expense for variable expenses. Caching is a technique to make future requests faster and reduce network throughput by temporarily storing data in an intermediary location between the requester and the permanent storage. In the anti-pattern example, no caching service is used when anyone requests a file from one of the Amazon Symbol Storage Services, S3 bucket. Each request takes the same amount of time to complete and each request cost the same. In the best practice pattern in the infrastructure, we use Amazon Cloud Front in front of Amazon S3 to provide caching. In this scenario, the initial request checks for a file in Amazon Cloud Front. If it is not found, Cloud Front requests the file from Amazon S3 and then Cloud Front stores a copy of the file at an edge location close to the user and sends a copy to the user who made the request. Subsequent requests for the file are retrieved from the now closer edge location to the user. This reduces latency and cost because after the first request, you no longer pay for the file to be transformed out of Amazon S3. Security is not only about getting through the outer boundary of your infrastructure, it is also involves ensuring that your individual environments and their component are secured from each other. For example, in Amazon EC2, you can create security groups that allow you to determine which port in your instance can send and receive the traffic. Now let us look to the AWS Global Infrastructure. The AWS Global Infrastructure is built around region. A region represents a physical geographical location with one or more availability zone. An availability zone is basically a logical isolation of the AWS cloud. Communication between regions use AWS Backbone Network Infrastructure. You can enable and control data replication across regions. An availability zone or each availability zone is made up of one or more data center designed for fault isolation interconnected with other availability zone in a region using a high-speed private link. For certain services, you can choose your availability zone and AWS recommends replicating your data across multiple availability zone for data resilience. There is also AWS local zone, which enable you to run latency sensitive portion of applications closer to end users and resources in a specific geography. Are an extension of an Amazon AWS region where you can use AWS services in a geographic proximity to end users. This will let you place AWS compute, storage, database, and other select services closer to a large population, industry, and IT center. Those local zones are managed and supported by AWS. Currently, only we have Los Angeles AWS local zone, which available by invitation. AWS data center are where the data resides and data processing happen. A data center typically has tens of thousands of servers. All data centers are online and serving customers. AWS custom network equipment are stored in those data center. To deliver content to end user with low latency, Amazon Cloud Front uses a global network that includes over 200 points of presence that are compromised of edge locations and regional edge caches. Edge locations are located in North America, Europe, Asia, Australia, South America, and Middle East, Africa, and China. Those edge locations support AWS services like Amazon Route 53 and Amazon Cloud Front. Regional edge caches are used by default with Amazon Cloud Front. They are used when we have content that is not accessed frequently enough to remain in an edge cache. Regional edge caches absorb these content and provide an alternative to fetching the content from the origin server. In this module, we learned how to define a cloud architecture, describe how to design and evaluate architectures using the Will Architecture the framework, explain the best practices for building solutions on AWS, describe how to make informed decision on where to place AWS resources. There is additional resources if you want to learn more about the Will Architecture framework that you can visit the AWS Global Infrastructure, and the AWS will architect the framework white paper. Thank you for seeing this video and see you in the next one.